I wonder though, um, what's going to be the ramifications after all this ends, right? And the government's given out millions and tens of millions and the world has given out... Hun- you good? Yeah, I just want to see what's under the table. It's monsters. <laughs> given out hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. How are they going to get that back? Yeah, I know. That's something I think about a lot. Well, I thought about it when ScoMo like, first announced everything. So like Prime Minister for the, my Americans. <laughs> all the plans of like what were going to be available to us and then how much they're worth because like $1,500 for JobKeeper per fortnight is a lot of money. You know how much that is in a year? It's like 70 grand. Well, there you go. It's, it's more... You can't be on it for longer than six months. No, but just if you break that down, um, let me just actually do the math. I want to give it to you real. I think it's 70, 52 weeks. It's 78 grand, okay? 78 grand. Mm-hmm. Who's, that's, that's above the mean of the average income of the Australian. Yeah. 26K in... Well, that's not true. Basically, it's above the average mean. And so people now... I'm, I'm, I wonder how people are going to live outside of their means now. Like how intelligently will the people spend or save that yeah because if you're not if you're getting all this money it's all taxable right Mm, i don't know it's probably something it's i believe it is yeah okay let's assume it is Mm. prepare for the worst Mm. let's say you're given six months which is and you get fifteen hundred dollars a week i'll give you best case scenario Uh, 52 weeks divided by two it's 39 grand yeah. Damn, 39 grand in six months. Yeah. Some people don't make that in a year. Mm. Cool. Are we Are we prepared for when... Are you prepared for when the government taxes the fuck <laughs> out of that? How are they going to get all the money back? Well, there's going to be a lot of people who do put it back into the economy, but then... Yes. And, like, that's what he's relying on. He's like, people obviously will save this money right now because they can't spend it on anything. And when they are right now, it's mostly online shopping, but that is in some way still stimulating the economy. But then when everyone can go out and do whatever the hell they want, mm. like a lot of people are going to realise they're just going to go all out. It's going to be like, well, I've got all this money that I've saved up. I'm just going to put it back into the economy. And like, that's kind of, that's what he wants. But then there are going to be some people who do save it. And that's not something that he wants. Well, Mr. Mo, <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister. I also love how we would just like have shortened our Prime Minister's name to something like that ends in like M-O or just like O, like the classic like O sound that we do for every Is that what we do? We abbreviate yeah. everything. That's we, what we, we do. do. Yeah. That's just... Like ScoMo, like it's just... yeah. I don't like know. there's not many other countries I think that abbreviate to as the much as we do. That that we abbreviate. But like they'll they'll give people nicknames. That's very common. Like the Orange Man. Who's the that? Orange man. Who's the Orange Man? Yeah, who's the Orange Man? Oh, the Orange Man is Donald oh, Trump. Old Who man Trump. Is? Yeah. Is that fake tan? It's got to be. <laughs> it's got to be. Come I've on, son. I've been wondering that and I just, I don't know what's going on. And they mentioned it briefly. Like they started to talk about it on Joe Rogan's, po- one of his podcasts one yeah. time. And I, and I was like, yep, I'm going to figure it out. This is what I'm going to know. And like, I, I don't know where we ended up back like, they also had the same, just like, I'm pretty sure it's fake tan, but we don't know. And the, it's weird because you look at photos and the complexion, is, I don't think it's even. Like, it's, is it an even complexion? Uh, is he totally kind of an orange hue? <laughs> I don't know. I don't pay attention to him that much, to be honest. See, Try not to look at him for too long. <laughs> it's and like looking at the sun. I don't want to listen to what he has to say, so like, why would I look at him? See, I think you... Sh- <laughs> I think you <laughs> Fair enough. Damn. I'm going to waste my time. I I, th- I actually pay probably a lot more attention to American government and politics than Australian. I know I could probably, uh, you know, there's like the fifth, like the constitution, America has a constitution. Yeah. There's a fifth amendment, the second amendment. Um, second amendment, I think is the right to bear arms. Like I, I know that stuff more than, what's Australia's constitution? Huh? I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Shouldn't, we, shouldn't we know a little bit? Doesn't that probably. dictate some of our freedoms and our abilities to, um, be citizens? It depends if you've got an issue with the way you're living. Oh, we all got You don't got have an issues. issue with the way that you're living. Oh, then we we'll got, <laughs> all got some issues. <laughs> Why are you more interested in the American 
constitution? I, uh, n- not specifically the constitution, but specifically America as a country. It is so amazing. I, th- I, I love it so much. And I think people love to shit on it and stigmatize it and stereotype it. Um, for example, when I get people feel even a bit fearful and intimidated when they see terrorist attacks or, or you, you'll, I don't know if you've seen videos of um, uh, people protesting these restrictions mm. in America. Yeah. Have like that, the real famous one of like the nurses on the on the road blocking the protesters, you mean? Oh, I didn't see that. What was that? It was um, just like a whole bunch of Americans that went out. I don't remember what city, but um, yeah, they were just like protesting out the front of a hospital or just in the street. Oh. Um, in their cars, like, you know, lift the, lift the lockdown, like, w- we can go out in society, it's fine, blah, blah, blah. And then um, there were a whole bunch of nurses just, like, right in front of them in a line along the Opposing road. Opposing them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just being like, what are you doing? It's like so a standoff. It, yeah, there's heaps of pictures. Like, it, yeah, it's... Um, Pull that up. Pretty confronting. <laughs> but I don't remember what city it was in. But um, that's the only thing that I've really seen about, about it. Well, I've... Oh. I have no internet right now. Um, I've seen uh, videos uh, similar in nature, but we're more referring to the uh, other members of society that are probably more in the minority, the more aggressive, very vocal, uh, like the ones who hold the signs up and say, it's all a hoax, it's a scam, and uh, let's all go back to work. And I I get the part of going back to work, right? Because it's Mm. people, when they can't work, they miss... there's like a hole left in them. Mm. Like it's like work is like. Even if they don't like their work. Yeah. When they don't Isn't that go, interesting? when they don't have their work for a while, even if they don't like it, their job. Yeah, it gets to people because they have no purpose. Exactly, they have no purpose, and that their purpose is revolved around their work. And it's not to say that's a bad thing. Um, Twenty seconds won't scrub hero blood off your hands. That's an aggressive sign, but there is uh, probably some merit to it. Um, Is it internet now? Yeah, I got it now. Yeah, uh, yeah I saw these protests and they're people honking their horns, like um, people all gathering really large groups, right? Mm. Which is antithetical to the, uh, to the idea of uh, what's well, going to help spread a virus. Yeah. Okay. So just by doing that act, yes, you get your voice spoken. Yes, protesting is, is how you sometimes create change. But if you then get an explosion in cases and deaths, then the government is likely to keep instilling, likely keep instilling the restrictive laws. Mm. Is that wrong? No. America's so different. Is like their I- idea of like, we are like such a free country in America. Like it's completely different to, even though we know we're quite free here, they're like, they always exercise that freedom is their right. Yeah. Whereas like, we don't really hear that much in Australia. It's like, we know we're, we've got it pretty good here. Like we're pretty free, but like, we also don't go to the extent of like opposing the government when our freedom is breached as much as Americans do. Do you think we should? When should we? Well, it depends what issue you you you, you want to um, support or not support, and like how much that affects your life or okay. millions of other people's lives. It depends. You don't know. Like depends on the issue. Yeah, it depends on the issue. I think it's a great point you brought up, though. I've heard that before um, recently and that the Americans do seem to pride themselves on liberty and freedom mm. and their ability uh, to express themselves, um, free speech, for example. And when that gets taken away, uh, something that, that is challenges their constitutional rights, as they call it, yeah. uh, there is uh, chaos. Yeah. And so I get it. It's like... it's really interesting to compare like Australia to America in that sense mm. we do respond very differently when our freedoms are taken away like they're trying to do this government tracking thing in America uh, with tracking people with the virus oh isn't that just introduced in our country yeah it did but it's voluntary here okay it's, they have to do it over there I don't know oh, okay Okay. I don't know if it's voluntary or involuntary over there I'd like someone to clarify um, I can see it just n- I can see a lot of people not wanting to do that in America <laughs> can you can you say why though can you see the slippery slope of where that goes? Well, yeah, and people already think like their privacy is breached. So they're oh yeah. Get breached have you more. seen the? Have you heard of Cambridge Analytica? No. Cambridge Analytica is a company that collected, uh, and I'm going to mess this up a little bit, but I'm going to summarize it. There was a documentary on Netflix that summarized um, big data and the fact that Cambridge Analytica was this big company mm. that uh, collected data from and aggregated it from like Facebook, 
Uh, oh, and they sell it on? Um, yeah, fa- social media and Cambridge Analytica is a British political consulting firm that combined misappropriation of digital assets, data mining, data brokerage, and data analysis with strategic communication during the electoral process. Okay. So it was a consulting company um, that had a scandal in 2018 because they found that Cambridge Analytica was harvesting millions and millions of people's Facebook profiles without the direct consent for political advertising. Right. So they essentially had a, they swayed the election in a way that they presented data and information to viewers and Mm. news articles, for example, that predisposed them for a certain reaction. Now, they base this, though, on personality trait testing and personality profiles that they developed on every person that they put a ad in front of so basically imagine this company did a personality profile on you Mm. okay and and so it would measure things like conscientiousness for example that's your willingness um to do a task to a very high quality degree Mm. right you care about the uh the task you're doing um and doing it well uh neuroticism how how sensitive you are to negative emotion Mm. someone is very high in neuroticism they're going to respond very heavily and emotionally to triggering news yeah so you can see all these different traits they said they had i think i heard they had like five thousand data points on every single american uh, facebook user something along the lines of that and they use this to deliver political information advertisement and that's i think an example of how data is being and has been used to have severe consequences in our society. In what way were they trying to skew a person's vote? Good question. I can't, I don't think I can answer that because I don't, I don't know Cambridge Analytica's agenda. Like it wasn't all like, okay, we want people to vote for Trump. We're That's a good question. Information. That's probably a really important question. I don't, that is. Or were they just doing it just to, I don't know. Well, there has to be an end game to it. There, I mean, there what does. Are they doing it? Avengers. <laughs> have you seen that? No. You haven't seen it? Isn't there a whole bunch of movies you have to see before you know what the fuck's going on? Now, you know what, I actually? I watched Wolverine the other day. Which one, though? The, There's about ten of them. Oh, there was a lot going on. It it definitely wasn't the first one because it ended with... There was, like, some chick. She was, like, a snake. And then there was, like, that big robot. And then Oh, yeah. And then he... he he threw him out the building or something? Yeah, yeah. The Asian guy? It all ends in like this fight and there's like that Chinese, uh, Japanese chick as well. Um, and they're like, yeah, you know, allies, like w- weird allies. Yeah, and it was just like so weird. I just thought Wolverine was just about this one guy with like claws for hands and like it wasn't. There was all this other stuff going on. And I was watching it with my partner and I was like, um, I feel like we missed something. <laughs> oh, yeah, you did. Because... <laughs> I don't know where all these people came from, but it was good though. I think you watched... Did you watch The Wolverine? I think yeah, you watched The Wolverine. just The Wolverine. Yes, and that was a 2013 one. Oh, yeah, you got to watch the X-Men series if you really want to get, like, the proper... I don't know. You're not... It just seems like a lot of effort. It is. Well... I like <laughs> Thor. I like the Thor movies because I've seen Ragnarok and I love the director of Ragnarok. And I... So then I was like, fuck, I'm going to watch the other ones now. They are... They're probably one of... They're fan favourites. Yeah. I like the humor in them. Oh, that's why Marvel's so good. Yeah, but I like I haven't seen X Men. I'm sure they have the same type of humor, but I just they're feel actually oh, similar uh, sometimes. Have you seen all all of them? Yes. There's all, like X Men. No, I've seen all the Marvel recent universe. Okay. So from the first, I think it was Iron Man or Hulk that started. I think it was Iron Man was the first one. If you watch like, go ahead. Want to say something? What? Me? Yeah, you. No, nah, I'm good. Who? <laughs> I feel like the audio just changed. I don't know what's going on there. Was anything? I don't know. Maybe this is you further, further away from the mic. LG. Yeah, like this and this. It's all good. Yeah, difference. <laughs> um, no, it, there's there's a lot of them, and I can see why it is a lot of technically a lot of effort. But it's not really to sit down there and enjoy like an amazing piece of entertainment. If it's decent, I'll I might watch another one. But right now, like I I watched Thor. Yeah, it's a great one. Um, Thor's great. Chris prob- Hemsworth. Probably the first one. I, yeah, look. I don't even know how he's disrespectful he <laughs> to the to just all these. Most people love Chris Hemsworth. I don't know. I don't watch it for Chris Hemsworth. Some people just watch it to see him. But he's great. Ed, Have you seen? He's the, not the best actor in it. No, no. I think once you watch, you got to see more of them to get the complete picture of like his humor and his delivery is so great. Mm. Um, 
particularly in the last movie when I'm not going to spoil anything. Um, Wait, what's the name of the last one? It's Avengers Endgame. Oh. Have you seen the big purple, purple thick guy? No, I have not. You, I'm sure you've seen photos of uh, Thanos. Oh, probably. Probably, but I've not known what the hell it was. She I'm like, oh, that's something else on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Just another weird thing I'm looking at today. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there, there's a lot of them. There's dozens. Why, I what happens with him? Does he turn I'm into him? I'm not going to spoil goes anything. No. I wouldn't want to spoil such an incredible movie series. Is Endgame on Disney Plus? They're all on They're Disney, all Plus, Disney Plus, Plus now. I have Disney Plus. You have it? Yeah. So, how did Disney Plus get you? Because what I didn't think would happen is people sign up for multiple services. People mm. sign up for Amazon, Netflix, and Disney Plus. I didn't think that would happen. Mm. Have you done that? Uh, I have two. I have Netflix and I have Disney Plus. People doing it. I don't think I would keep Disney Plus, though. If I was to get rid of it, be, it would be Disney Plus. But right now, like during COVID, I might as well have Disney Plus. I mean, I get eighty dollars less taken out of my account every week because my every month, sorry, not every week. Wow, because my gym doesn't charge me because I don't go. <laughs> so I might as well use twenty bucks of that eighty bucks to get two good streaming platforms. I <laughs> I love it how it's like I have gone from training my body and mind and paying for that membership to the exact opposite <laughs> into. I was gonna say couch potato, but but I still train. I train at home, but it's just yeah. like. I would love it's to. Free. I would prefer to train at the gym because I don't have the equipment at home. Do you think it's a motivation as well? A lot of people like they want to go somewhere. Yeah. To train. Yeah, because you end up associating that place with working out. Whereas, like, if you go home, you're like, I'm at home now. I'm just gonna chill out. Like, yeah. You associate that place with relaxing and. We. That's why I'm trying to make like certain rooms. I'm trying to associate Great certain rooms idea. with things. I'm very lucky. We, I live in Richmond in a, in a little apartment, but we have a spare room, so we've just made that the workout room. Nice. Um, so if we're going in there, we're probably going to go in there to work out rather than, I don't know, I'm not, not going to sit in there with my laptop and watch Disney Plus, that's for sure. Right, that's the workout room. Yeah. I think that's really smart. Like, you need to designate, I saw this video, um, and it was like, they, they, it portrayed this situation of everyone stuck in this situation with restrictions, right? Mm. And it, it portrayed this little stick figure animation man in a spaceship, a space shuttle. And it's like the, probably the size of half of this room. Yeah. And so it's like, imagine you're that, and you're floating through space and you can't get out you don't know when you're going to dock and you have to partition like he drew like certain areas of the floor this is my workout space this oh, is yeah. my sleep space this is my workspace right and i think that's exactly how you do it yeah because you don't want to associate work and sleep and sex and relaxation yeah all in the one place yeah it's it's harder when people don't have the like not a lot of people have a spare room hanging out in their house they can just use for that kind of stuff to make it their own you know especially if they've got a family like that room's probably it's not going to be used for that yeah so um you'll do the best you can yeah i think i think the the bedroom is like a place you really need to figure out what, what you want to do in there what you don't want to do in there mm. like i don't have a tv in my bedroom i've never had one in, actually i have once i had tv in my bedroom once but like i never want to have one in my bedroom in the future same Cause like, I would just spend too much time in my bed, and like, the, the bedroom should be for like sleep and sex, and basically that's it. I'm even, I'm even, I'm thinking like, I need another bed for sex. <laughs> like I'm, I'm thinking like because it's stimulating, it's yeah, relaxing after, <laughs> maybe. It's stimulating, but then it's relaxing. But it's like, it could be a, it can be vigorous activity sometimes, right? Mm. And <laughs> it's like real first world problems, right? <laughs> this is me and my monkey chimp mind trying to partition out. All right, this for this for this. Um, so that's probably never going to happen, but it may. Don't say never. Okay. Never say never. <laughs> well, why? You have two rooms, though. I don't have two rooms. Do you have? Two I have a rooms? I have a I have a work room upstairs, a study room. Yeah. Right, where am I doing my work? And that, that was one of the best things I did. If one recommendation I have for people, um, like you or anybody, is like. Don't work in the same room you sleep in. Yeah. Because the work is associated with like the monkey mind switching on. All right. It may be a little bit of a heightened sympathetic stress, which can be good. Like it's called you stress. Um, and being in front of a, a computer screen, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's been one of the best things I do because when I walk in my bedroom, it is a calming, down regulating place. Yeah. It is not a place of. Stress or work. Yeah. I want to go upstairs to that office or whatever space you have. You switch on. I'm here to work. That's a large space you have, though. 
you were to like make it another like that's a big space upstairs it's good it is well half of it is one thing yeah, half of it is is like a more of a, it's a television there and a couch so that's for the other thing yeah yeah for taking my i i uh i really enjoy movies and tv shows and i that i've considered that now my drugs like that's my drugs movies and tv shows. yeah yeah it's like i've had this recent thought i'm like i don't i don't uh, do any illicit drugs mm. i haven't yet but for now what do you mean by like what are you excluding from that uh, everything i'm excluding everything but alcohol okay okay that's the place i'm at right now yeah i want to i want to master my own mind before i um let any other substances control me uh not all substances control people though like substances open up your mind so then they can help you control yeah. yourself yeah that's that's yeah that's a great point that's a great point um, I think that's why they're so useful for so many people, mm. which is why I've switched my tune on them. Like, I think it's a matter of time before marijuana is legalized, rightfully so, Yeah. in every major Western country. Yeah. My, um, a few of my friends and some people that I work with take magic mushrooms yep. sometimes. And, like, all I've heard from people who have done that is, like, just make sure you're in the right headspace before you do it and it can really open your eyes up yeah um that's something i wouldn't mind trying in a safe space yeah certain hallucinogens i think (coughs) plant-based substances are the most um enticing and interesting yeah not made chemically in a lab yeah rather than just some not some random but like you know buying a pill you don't know what's in it not really knowing what and that's my half my biggest problem is i don't have the technology right now to test and i just want to test just like I can test, um, read the ingredients labels on what I'm eating, mm. I want to be able to know what drug or substance is going in. Well, that's why there's, um, I think it's in the UK, and or maybe it, w- it would be definitely be in Europe because they'd be more progressive than us in terms of that kind of stuff. But they do have those testing kits, and when when mm. you are going to a festival and you buy something off some random that you don't know mm. you can just take the testing kit along with you pop it in and then like shake it it's like you know have you ever seen like border patrol mm. and they just say oh you know we found this real sus looking package we put this drug or the powder into the thing and you shake it and if it turns a specific color then it's this type of drug or it's got it's this or something so they sell those in europe and you can take them to festivals and that's, that's why and that's something that has been proposed to our government a fair few times but they're, they're just still like no nah. But it would actually be safer because then people know what they're taking and it would mean that there will be Excuse me. better quality and like more pure drugs to buy rather than these impure substances that are cut with whatever else. And you could theoretically reduce the risks associated with uh, accidental drug overdoses. Well, yeah, and just say, you know, someone tested it and they still took it, but then they had a bad reaction to it, they had an overdose, then they could say, well look like this is exactly what I had yeah and then that would help them like get treated more quickly that's great rather than like just have, having a stab at like oh it could be this could be this but I know I, I can take a guess why the government wouldn't want to implement that I get why do you can, can you do you know have an answer to that why they wouldn't want to do it well they don't want people buying drugs like if they allow people to buy testing kits mm-hmm. then that's basically them saying Everyone, like, you can sell drugs now. It's it's all good. You can buy drugs because you've got this kit and you'll be fine. Right. Um, it's along those lines. It's like we're supporting... We don't support you buying it. We don't support you selling it. But, you know, if you're going to do it, and we know you're going to do it, mm. here's a testing kit for it that we're kind of supporting you with. It just yeah. It's along those lines of the government stepping towards uh, support for drug legalization, which I think is a, a, a slippery slope if you don't want any legalization yeah so i get it but some people do buy those kits you can buy them you buy them here yeah online. good not here. i don't know if you can buy them even here. online i know some people buy them online they get sent from like europe and you talked about we talked about earlier you said that the government the prime minister the want to the australians to use this money to put it back into the economy mm. right the australian economy mm. it doesn't stop people buying a lot of stuff from overseas yeah i mean that's a huge thing most of us get our e-commerce from overseas have you seen 
all the memes getting around and just some silly people who are just like, don't buy anything from China right now. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it. I just no. It's so funny. It's just they're just like, don't buy anything from China right Is now. Don't support the country that gave us this virus. It's really intense. It's, really, <sighs> it's crazy. There's, as someone who's, you have a unique perspective as someone who's lived in China for how long? A year? A year. When you were how old? 22. 23. You were studying? One of those. 22. Yeah. What, where did, what province did you live in? Area? Um, I lived in Shaanxi province. There's two. It's two Shaanxi? There's two. One of them has got double A. One of them is just one A. Way to confuse us all. <laughs> China. They're pronounced differently. So if you were Chinese, you'd know just by saying the word. But yeah. if I was just like saying Shaanxi in English, like they'd be like, which one? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I lived in Shaanxi province and I lived in the capital of that province. I'm pretty sure it's capital in Xi'an. So are you done? I'm done. <laughs> That's all I did there. I just lived, <laughs> lived and studied in travel. Did you exper- Did you see any? Uh, how do I say? Mm, did you see any behaviour by government, police that was suspect? Um, not by individuals, like in person. I seen it from the media. Such as? Like we had TV in our room. We lived in an international students' hotel. It was quite nice, but it was just like shared a room and um. Yeah, you'd be watching TV one day. I think it was the one English channel that we had and they'd have news on there. But I don't remember where that channel was based. It might have been American. And so, like, if something came on that was ne- that negatively shown, like, the Chinese government or any Chinese person in any way, it would just go black. It would start, it would go black. <laughs> the screen would go black. The screen would go black. So what would the situation be? Like a news report? Yeah. You'd be watching it and you'd be like, okay. And then, like... I don't know what happened. Something, oh, there was like a really big thing. And oh, I don't remember. There was like some Chinese government official did something. And um, I remember watching it on that channel. And like it started. And I was like, it was after a few months of living there. So I was like, this is weird. Because I got accustomed to the TV just blacking out all the time. Because, you know, everyone gets used to things after they've been like shown right. for months. And I was like, this is weird. It's still like on the TV. And I was like, what this was is. It? I don't remember exactly what it was. But I just remember like some Chinese government official doing something that he shouldn't have been doing. And I was watching this TV and it was running for like a good 30 seconds. And I was like, this is too long. And then like <laughs> in the next 10 seconds, it cut out. Because if you catch it the first time it runs, like you're going to get the most out of it because like they haven't caught up to it being on TV yet. So if you catch it like the very first time that it runs wherever, whatever news channel it's broadcasted it from, like you see a little bit more of it than you normally would because they don't catch it. But then once they get it, like you'll just know that it'll be cut like within one second of that coming up, coming up again because the news just replays throughout the day the same as our news here so like it was very interesting it was like things would just it would just be a black screen that is so and it's so obvious it's just so such obvious such an obvious example of censorship it is so obvious and um you would never see um oh there was I don't remember what movie it was but there was a movie came out and basically it might have been Will Smith or it might have been another like black actor but they would they wouldn't the posters that were displayed in china for that movie just excluded that black character at all really yeah because china have the second largest um uh fucking cinema grossing um i'm really badly wording it right here do you know what i mean like america's number one for like making money with movies censorship no 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 i'm talking about like capital from making movies oh okay yeah like just, viewership just money that they, oh, yeah. yeah china is the second biggest market america's the first okay yeah so well yeah it makes sense it's like you know so many people live in china so of course yeah so will smith movie it might not be will smith i just remember it being a black actor in a movie and the posters that were shown in america um were different to the ones shown in china because they don't they exclude the black actors from it even though it's the same movie that's crazy yeah and it happens all the time like but you don't notice, like, I didn't notice that for a while because I just, I seen the post and I was like, oh, that movie's coming out. But also, I'm not a big movie buff, so that doesn't help. But I actually seen, it was in April, I think, when I went on to, had a VPN. So I went on to Facebook for the first time in four months because you can't get on Facebook in China. They're coming for you. Uh, well, too late now. I, was, I haven't lived there for ages. But um, I remember seeing that on Facebook, like, but 
had I not gone on Facebook, I wouldn't have even noticed it. I would have just assumed that was the actual poster for wow. the for the movie because that's what you're shown. It's like reverse, it's not a reverse. It's reverse racism in the sense that I think Australia and a lot of countries, um, they project uh, prejudice and uh, racism, and there's another word I'm think trying to think of um, against people from China, Chinese populations, different Asian populations. Yeah. Um, and I think this has been exacerbated in some ways by this, this situation with um, this virus originating in yeah. the Wuhan. Yeah. Which is, unfortunately... People still don't know exactly how it started. Yeah. What's your idea? I've dived down, I've dived down a lot of rabbit holes. Mm. Um, and I think there are multiple plausible uh, origins. Mm. I think the first one that they were saying was, well, okay, we have to look at the... <laughs> you, I didn't even hear you. You're good. You have to look at like multiple different mechanisms of how the virus, uh, the genetics of it, and I wish I won't pretend to be far from an expert on, but some experts say, and virologists say, that look at the, the genetic code. Like there is proper articles, like full pages, dissecting the genetic code of uh, SARS-CoV-2 which is mm. technically what it's called. And they call it a, 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 zoo, a zootonic, zootonic or zootic uh, virus, which means it's transferred from an animal down to a human, okay? And then they identify some parts of the, the genome that say we have X and Y certainty. Actually, you know what? I, pu- I should just pull the, my fucking notes up because I've actually, I've note taken this down um, because I found it particularly uh, interesting. Um, so there's one plausible mechanism that came from a, a, a bat to then a pangolin. Yeah, but people were mis 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 accurately saying it was just bat to human. I've heard oh. this penguin. Yeah, I've people ate a bat. People, lick, you don't have to actually eat and consume the animal yeah. to get transmission. It can just be by contact from these wet markets, which are fucking atrocious. If you there's one thing say- that's real, it's these wet markets. Yeah, you gonna say? Um, yeah, people think it's from like the animal itself, but you can just touch a surface that that animal's feces have been on. Correct. And, and you see, if you see, have you seen photos or videos from the wet markets? Have you ever seen one in real life? You've been to China. Um, I'm pretty sure I've been to one. Hey. Really? Yeah, but I haven't actually looked at too many photos of them. I've been to a lot of markets in China that were just way like completely different than any other market I've ever been to. What did you see? Like, just animals that n- aren't normally in markets. Like wild animals. Wild animals were like dogs and stuff, so yep. like dead dogs just hanging up everywhere. And um, it wasn't the, the dog market, like the famous dog market that a lot of people know about. Um, but just like animals that you just would never see, and they're all displayed quite differently, and they're slaughtered right in front of you in the market. So yeah, most likely I went to a wet market, but um, at that time I was just like, oh, these what the markets are like here. You know, I didn't think there was. And really you would you you adapt your baseline, what we call your hedonic set point, adapts to this new set of circumstances yeah yeah now this is normal yeah pretty much because you just don't you don't know when you go to a country like that i think it's they're being put on the map now yeah. but the problem is when uh another virus spread from i gotta look it up now um there was another virus that spread uh from these wet markets and they closed them down have you heard about this um yes and then they reopen them back up. Is this also in China? Yeah. So. That's why they, the government, like they um, brought out that rule a long time ago. And then they, yeah, they were just like, you know what? We're going to open them back up again because people wanted to go back to the wet markets. Yeah. And because it actually has like, it, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, like $150 billion industry that exerts influence over the Chinese government for lobbying capabilities. Okay. So it actually has political influence. Mm. Um, so the what they did is they where was it um anyway they're selling some crazy shit endangered wildlife tigers rhinos pangolins tigers and rhinos like uh i saw one on a video on bears just these giant bears in these tiny cages which is crazy i used to see a lot of tortoise shells all the time it would make me really sad really yeah damn and they, they get really old. Like, they yeah, live a long life. Yeah. Tortoises go through some shit. And their shells, you know, they get really, really big. And, like, they just, they're just stacked on top of each other at markets. It's really sad. 
Yeah, but that's the reality of the situation. After this, they banned, the, they banned them and then they've recently reopened them again. Okay. That's exactly what they did about 10 years ago with, uh, I believe that was another type of virus that spread. Yeah. And so, unless, it's just a risk. Regardless of whether it come, came exactly from this, we find out it came from somewhere different. Was it swine flu? Was that the original? Because that came from China, did it not? Unsure. Unsure. Um, I'm f- I've done a video on it, but f- um, I can't remember right now. It's just so much information in my brain. Um, I, I really want to... Uh, Elon Musk, I need a neural implant. Please hook me up. Have you seen what he's doing with um, Neuralink? No. He's basically... He, he's doing it under... The, this is how we become robots, okay? Mm. So Elon Musk is going to take us to the Matrix. Or maybe he'll get us out. Have you seen the Matrix? No. <sighs> <laughs> She needs to wake up, guys. She needs to, she needs to have that red pill. I'm awake. What red pill? What are you talking about? See, she doesn't know. She's yeah, my life isn't any different. She's so. taking that blue pill. <laughs> Even if I did know. Exactly. I That's the question. I didn't about that red pill, blue pill thing the other day. It had yeah. made, made absolutely no sense to me. I'm yeah. Like, I don't get it. Okay. The, the red pill is synonymous with waking up to okay. the reality and the lies that we've all been told. Okay? Mm. So there are communities called red pill. And these red pill communities um, usually attract... Uh, weak men who want to be strong men yeah. it doesn't have to be men but it's, it's very common mm. um, who want to wake up to the the lies and the and the misnomers of the world and basically want to wake up from from the matrix like neo did in the matrix yeah so the matrix is one of the the most iconic um well-made i think movies i've ever seen i just finished watching the last one yesterday and it's brilliant. It, it, it's why when they say when I say movies are like drugs, it's because they take you and transport you to another universe. They make you think. They make you question your reality, and they provoke interesting thought-provoking questions. And so, mm. if you want to get taken down that path, it's almost like self-development through movies, or at least I like thinking it like that. <laughs> um, it depends what type of movies you choose. Sure, you can mm. watch uh, The Simpsons, which I love too. The Simpsons is a great show. Why do you think that? I agree. Well, there's a lot of, you know, when you watch it as a kid, you don't really get. Oh no. The adult. Homer and Marge having sex every the... second episode. <laughs> you don't realize that. You just don't get the adult humor, and it. it's the same with South Park as well. Like my dad loved South Park when I was a kid, and I didn't get it. My brother and I thought that he would never let us watch South Park because he would never let us watch The Simpsons. But it was on SBS one time, and we watched it, and he was like, "This is hilarious." So it was like, "Sick, great." My dad likes watching South Park. <laughs> but now I'm a bit older, I get it because there's a lot of adult jokes. Yes. On South Park. And The Simpsons that I just didn't get when I was a kid. I was just like, oh, funny cartoons. Yeah, cool. they're moving. They're, yeah, they're yellow, punching. Great, four-fingered humans, awesome. Like, But they're so self-aware. Like, they made a joke about being four fingers, and they said it was like a joke about, like, a five-finger human, a five-finger creature. And they made a joke about that being so strange and weird. Oh, yeah. Which yeah, is so yeah, self-aware because <laughs> we think they're weird for yeah. having four fingers. Yeah. So I'm like, they're so clever. Have you, um, have you seen Big Mouth? No, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. It's pretty good. Hey. It's Netflix? Yeah, it's Netflix. It looks so strange. It's it's really good. Yeah? Yeah. Um, Is it, what's it, what after. do you compare it to? Um, like Rick and Morty? Um, yeah, I, yeah, but it's different because it's about puberty. So it's, you know, Rick and Morty, I don't really know what that show is about. If I could, like, I've watched a few episodes of Rick and Morty, but I still couldn't tell you exactly what that show is about. Whereas this one, like, you know, you've got these two two minimum two like the main two like puberty monsters following these kids and like showing them throughout puberty and like it's very different now because you can s- you can see like that movie or that show was made this year or last year or whatever because they go through topics of like gender fluidity rather than like just like oh there's a boy and a girl and like helping their little puberty child help like like helping that person maybe try and get with a chick like s- they're just like okay well yeah, you can like a chick, but you can also like that guy and you can like want to be with both or you might want to be with one more than the other sometimes and like it's okay. Is it like challenging current issues and talking yeah, about them? Yeah, rather than just ignoring it and just or saying they don't exist. Like there was an episode the other day, it was about all the different types of um, like, I don't, even, I don't even know how to say it because it's... Sexual orientation? Yeah. Like sexual preference? Sexual both. Sexual identity? Yeah. Like all, all, of all of it, like, and there's a lot, and like, it's so very overwhelming to yeah. even consider. <laughs> One day I sat down and I was looking up what <sighs> LGBTQIA, but the they, whole thing. They, you keep, they keep adding letters. <laughs> yeah, I know. It doesn't end. Yeah, I know. We have to have boundaries with something, don't we? Do we? 
I think every man and woman must... Depends def- what it is. I even say man and woman on this topic. It, it begins to seep into your speech and it begins to... And maybe it should in some ways. Um, but uh, here is an interesting thing that I think it hasn't permeated these um, politically correctness. It has not permeated any... And I've been really impressed and... and, and interested that it hasn't yet but any like of our nutrition or physiology anatomy physiology university studies for me it hasn't touched that like in what way like like, what are you expecting them to do well i'm expecting them to an extent to cave to the pressure of political correctness and no longer teach that there's three different types of sex um gonadal sex uh, uh phenotypical sex and genetic sex Okay, and these three different types of sexes can actually be used for the arguments of identifying with different sexual orientations mm. and sexual identities. And I think that's a way to bring science into the equation that helps people make these arguments because I think people are arguing from very emotional perspectives. And I'm like, okay, hold on. You can, act, there we have XXXY chromosome, but we actually have different. Um, you can be like XO, you can be XX. Like there is, there is different uh, mutations that you can be. So that's genetic sex. And then you have uh, gonadal sex, which describes your internal uh, sexual reproductive organs. You yeah. can have, you can, be gen- you can be genetically a male or female, but have a, a different, uh, what the fuck did I just say? What was the word? Gonadal? Yes, gonadal. Thank yeah. you. There's, there's so many to remember. You can have genetic male and gonadal female it depends um you mean gonadal female um physical uh, organs yes yes yeah and then phenotypically which is uh, actually your genitals that you present on your body mm. can be the same or different and so these different levels and we have to consider that you know what there could be something going on there that you just you don't know you haven't tested you don't know that could explain a lot of these uh sexual identity differences yeah. Yes. That's also got to do with um. It took a lot of brain power for me to say <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Yeah, um, <laughs> At where certain things sit, um, I don't remember, remember exactly what they're called because I haven't. This is like from the cells and genes you know I did a while ago. Um, where like certain things sit on like where certain alleles will sit on a genome or a, you know it's just depending on where that where they sit is like how much they're going to express and like you can it's exactly what you said like you can have like XX. Or you could be like X Y, but like maybe that's why some people like there. There would have to be like a scientific reason why some people feel they want to be a bit more feminine than another individual. Yeah. And I feel like that's true. But we just haven't like gone deep into it yet. Maybe like because there's until more people come out and say like I have. Hey, I feel like this. Like I know I'm a guy, but um, I feel like I want to express my feminine side a bit more than my my best friend who's also a guy and like maybe if we got those two people together and then like looked into their dna Mm -hmm. properly but that takes a lot of money and that takes a lot of time that would be what isn't that called dna printing no it's not dna printing they do it dna printing no genome sequencing that's when they look at the whole genome yeah it's genome sequencing yeah yeah so like like 23 me even though that's not the entire thing i get it not nah, the like the full on thing, not okay. just like not, not like twenty three me, but yeah, um, yeah, a more in depth version of that. But that takes a while. I'm pretty sure it's something imprinting. I don't think it's something sequencing. I'm pretty sure it's like something imprinting. But um, yeah, like I feel like there is um a scientific reason why some people feel like they're more feminine than others. Absolutely. Or why some women might feel like they're more masculine than others, and um, we just didn't have the capacity many many years ago to express the way that we feel so we just assume that everyone was if you're a boy you felt like you're a masculine if you're a girl then you act more feminine and like but i don't think that's true and it takes a while for us to catch up to that as well it's going to take us ages before more people come forward and like hey maybe we will actually like do this kind of if it's genetic imp- i'm pretty sure it's genetic imprinting okay um I'll look it up <laughs> on this massive group of people but you need enough people to come out well you don't just need that you also need like a cause for funding a lot of these so many research studies get done all the time right but you need like to do a do a 
like a proper um, like a randomized controlled trial, gold standard. Like you need a lot of money, mm. right? And if you need a lot of money, you need backers. And if you need backers, you need they usually need some type of agenda or reason to do it. If you usually studies don't get done just for the sake of knowing a little bit more, unless there is a reason that can be something can be created from it, like a product or service that then makes money. Yeah. Which is why like pharmaceutical trials are so done all the time. That's happened all the time. Genomic imprinting is an inheritance process independent of the classical Mendelian inheritance. It is an epigenetic process that involves DNA methylation and histine methylation without altering the genetic sequence. <laughs> Sorry. That's I'm not there yet. I'm just not there yet with my with my with my own DNA methylation to understand that. So not it. Uh, I'm pr- I I'm I should remember this. I don't want to look at my phone. I don't remember. Um, but I know that with that type of um, science, that you can you can find those kind of kinds of things out. Right. Um, and there's there's one thing. Um, th- uh, interestingly, to make it more practical for people and for anybody who knows somebody who may be experiencing like a, a sexual identity crisis of some sort. You can look at the science of it. For example, the absence of uh, the SRY gene in an XY male may lead to the development of the female reproductive tract. Mm. Okay? So in the absence of the SRY gene, there is okay, there is no production of these other different um, uh, genetic uh, factors like SOX9, blah, blah, blah. But you don't need to know that. Okay, the point is um, you can have absence of certain genes that may promote the production of certain uh, gonadal sex. Yeah. You don't know. You don't know what, what the fuck... Unless you get tested and scanned, you don't know. Yeah. So could that explain a lot of what people are feeling? How much of it is uh, biological versus psychological? Yeah. The psychological part is interesting. Something that I... Oh, yeah. I don't want to skip to like too many different topics at once, but... um. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah, I know. We do it all the time. Like, Still shit, haven't got to so the origins things. of the coronavirus. Yeah, I yeah, know. We started and then we just jumped. Um, but um, so uh, something that I was speaking about... Um, not me personally, but um, someone that I know who knows someone else. Um, basically, that person has experienced some sexual abuse as a child, and then now that person's grown up, they've decided that they want to have a sex change. So they're going from female to male. Um, and but there's also um, when you look at people who are um, like trauma survivors of child abuse um one way that they can heal from that which sometimes may actually be because deep down they actually do want to be a man or they do want to be a different gender is that they will want to escape their own gender because that's the gender that they've been abused as so they will Mm -hmm. be like oh i i should be a male but but they haven't actually addressed but they don't actually want to be a male like if they were to address it they have they don't actually want to be a male it's because they're trying to escape their trauma of sexual abuse to say because it's a female um so this person's yeah and that now saying i'm going to go from female to male um but i but sometimes like that can't be because she feels deep down that she was born a male this might be because she was abused as a child so is it the right thing for her to do or is it just a way to escape her trauma That's as a, a child. great question. So there are like people who, like I do believe there is definitely like um, scientific um, reasons why people do want to be a male or, or do want to be a female. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but then there are also psychological reasons. And But changing genders is a life-changing experience that can cost you a lot of money. And I don't know if you can reverse it. So... I yes. wonder if there's someone out there who's, who they've been abused as a child and then they've decided to have a, a sex change and then they've realised I've done the wrong thing. But at some point they've used the excuse of I, was, I, was, I feel like I've been born to be a male but I, I, I represent as a female everything that I have is female. But their actual reasoning why they're doing it is because they, they're addressing abuse as a child. Okay, as you, you brought up a number of really important things. Uh, Very one long-winded, but I got there. <laughs> no, 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 that, no, not long-winded. Like properly, uh, succinct. Um, one is you're trying to 
the ability to escape trauma mm. via changing biology. Yeah. You become a different person. Yeah. That's one. Another important point you, you mentioned, which is really important, that, but there's an explanation for it, is that you change sex, you realize, oh no, I made a mistake. Mm. However, here's one reason why that is very unlikely. There's something called the sunk cost fallacy. Have you heard of it? Mm -mm. It's a cognitive fallacy that people trick themselves into. It's when you invest a large amount of resources money, energy, time into a certain behavior and action, you are less likely to change that and go back on it because it's cost you a lot to get there. Yeah. You're, you're less likely to realize that it was a mistake. Does that make sense? Yeah, but what's that in talking about? That's probably talking about someone who spent a lot of money trying to get a career in something and then realizing that, hey, they didn't actually want to do it. But like gender is a completely different thing. Like, No, but I mean I'm the act of changing your gender. Yeah. And I'm saying now we're talking about you've changed the gender and you're now going to, I've, I, I'm going to make a realization that this was a mistake. Yeah. Now why I think that's less likely is because of this fallacy, because you know how much energy and resources and time and money you would have encouraged, you would have have to sum up to get to that point. Mm. And I'm saying it's more, I think it's more unlikely that person's going to then be so, so self-aware that they've realized that was a mistake because of the sunk cost fallacy. At the end of the whole process. Yes. Whereas they might, that's like, maybe after the first hormone injection of something, they'd be like, actually, this is Right, okay, yeah, yeah, fair, fair, fair. Um, I haven't heard of that fallacy, no. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Um, Um, We trick ourselves all the time. (laughs) Our chimp minds. So primitive. Thinking that we want to do things, but we don't. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, building self-awareness around that, I think, is so important. Mm. It's like a mission as a human being should do. Part of waking up and taking that red pill is realizing these things. There you go. Anyway, as you were saying. But yeah, I just I wonder if um, like how much the psychological part will play a role in people's feelings of their own sexual orientation, because they don't, they might not be self-aware of past experiences that they've faced and so maybe they'll do something or start doing something that actually isn't the right way for them and then hopefully they're uh, they're awake enough to realize and i'm sure they would i've obviously not been through the process of changing my gender i don't know anyone personally who's been through the process of changing their gender but um yeah i would assume i guess like now that you've made your your point that process is long i know that and i would assume that a person hopefully wouldn't get all the way through and then realize this was a mistake but I think there would be some people out there who would start and then realize it was a mistake. I can see that. Um, but then they have to they have to find out where those feelings have came from, and that's when they hopefully will seek help. That's <sighs> a different thing in itself, like. And it's interesting how much of it originates to trauma mm. and experiences as a child and as an adolescent, and how those shape us. Yeah. They shape and mold us. And I think a duty and responsibility of all of us is to break ourselves from the shackles of our traumas and past indoctrinations as children and as young adults and to find our own meaning and responsibility, fulfillment in this life. I think that it, that, that is an inherent mission that we should all aim to attain because no matter who you are you can likely relate to some type of ineffective parenting that has negatively adversely impacted you Mm. so what it's not it's not your fault but it's damn for sure your responsibility to fix yourself now yeah yeah what's the alternative not realizing not realizing have your own kids do the same thing you they go on to the do past. the same thing <laughs> exactly yeah i've um i've only just started this yesterday but i enrolled in a short course on child adversity child adversity it's actually called child adversity um what's the full name of that i should know i only started it yesterday it's okay who's this fr- who delivers it future learn they can actually go through future learn so the uni that we go to they provide courses thanks for telling everybody where i went oh there we go 
Um, you, can, you can come not see me on the campus because <laughs> I don't go you there. You never go. Um, well, hold on. Yeah. Uh, I like going in person, but not right now. To the practicals. Not right now. Oh. I've actually been wondering if it's open, if anything's open. Some th- they've s- I got a lot of their emails. Some things are open, but it's very limited. It's very limited. Is the library? I wouldn't mind going to the library. I miss the library it, so no, it, much. It's a good place just to uh, get shit done. Yeah, I know. It's a great library too. Um, anyway, it's called Child Adversity, <laughs> The Impact of Childhood Maltreatment on Mental Health. Yeah. I started that yesterday. It's a three-week That's course. That's great. Um, yeah, I haven't got too far into it, obviously, but um, what I have watched, the only like real point that um, I've taken away is the, the main thing that um, like psychologists and um, social workers know that is like the most effective thing for a child who has suffered some kind of abuse from someone else is their current and main caregiver that they have at the time whether that be wait a f- what, what were you saying their current and main giver is what their current and main caregiver so like whether that be a foster parent or a new adoptive parent so that one person like is the person that's going does, it's not going to be friends it's not going to be um the past family that abused them it's that main caregiver at the time um of their childhood that is the the one person who affects like the, their future choices and decisions that they make in adult life based on their childhood trauma okay assuming they have a different parent yeah so assuming they move on and they will unfortunately like you know some people um will go into the foster system and then they'll get given a foster parent and that parent yeah. is going to be hugely yeah impactful yeah. to shaping them yeah makes sense but it doesn't matter about like just say they go to school and they meet all these people at school and they're like oh these people are my mates and yeah. um they might go over to their mates houses and by some lucky chance that friend has got a, a, a mom and dad that are still together like it's not going to be their mom and dad um it's going to be the main caregiver that they have at the time and if it's a couple um it's normally always one it's normally always one there's one main one and um they'll choose that main caregiver pretty early on but that main caregiver might not even know like Mm. subconscious that could be a mum and a dad but they might just choose the dad but the mum thinks it's her so she like goes all out but actually they're looking at what the dad's doing yeah. So they have to both be on their A game, and that's what that's what you expect if you're going into like foster ca- in the I I don't know like that system, but yeah. if you obviously put your hand out to be a foster parent, then you expect to bring your A game when you get a child. So yeah, but yeah, there's normally always just one, even though they might um, have a mum and dad. I think I don't. I'm sure there's many multiple mechanisms that explain it, but you know, you think about this child that has been gone through whatever adverse experiences they have learnt the world through this lens mm. now there's another chance there's, there's some hope and whatever that child the child I, I imagine is trying to latch on to something next it's trying to latch on and look for something for some to model after and it makes sense or it picks one because humans goes in pairs typically right so you pick one and you model yourself after that that's why it's so important because uh who you are speaks so loud the world can barely hear a world you're saying. I believe that's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Repeat that again. Who you are mm. speaks so loud mm. that the world can't hear a word you're saying. Right. So it's the idea of like people talk, talk, talk. It doesn't matter. It's like who you are is the loudest representation of who you are when someone looks at you yeah. and the things, how you act. Yeah. And so I think... I've been very interested. I'm very interested in parenting and child development and trauma, mm. as you sound similar in some ways. Um, you know, and I heard from a from a father today listening to a, a talk of Elliot Hulse's father, actually Edmund Hulse, and he he said, you know, if you're if you're lazy, it's very simple. He said it very simply. He said, like, if you're, if you're lazy and, and you um selfish, you shouldn't have a family because you're, you're not going to develop a strong family with those characteristics. And it sounds very simple, right? Mm. But how many people really think about, like, really break down, especially our parents and our parents' parents, 
that would just like follow trends that would follow the norm how many of them really thought like okay financial emotional cognitive responsibility what am i like as a human being have i dealt with my shit Mm. because i'm just going to put that on my child whether i know it or realize it or not yeah i think we're all this generation and the generation above us have all experienced the uh a consistent uh, sometimes lack of thought and consideration in the act of creating a child but it's very easy our for me to say or our parents generation uh, i think a bit of both yeah you can disagree i think more with our parents generation because they were also having children it was the norm for them to have children quite early on yeah like probably early more 20s. common my mom she would have had me when she was just 20 really and i'm assuming she would have had can you imagine that knee, which, oh no, she, she would have been 21 when she had me i reckon Oof. 22 and like my brother is obviously a year older than me so it would have been a year before that so quite young i'm already like five years older than her when she would have had her first child yeah so but this but our generation i, th- yeah, I think they're more self-aware yeah i think we do a more conscious job at that uh, maybe I'm giving benefit of the doubt. Maybe we'll look back and it'll be similar. Maybe it's all just patterns. Just yeah. expresses itself like in different maybe ways. Maybe our parents went through this same discussion at one point <laughs> when they were a lot younger than what we were, but it was the same discussion. I don't think they've seen the Matrix and woken up. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're going to be good parents next minute. Oh, no. I think you try, right? A lot of people, you try your best. You try your best. But, but you, can want to, you can want to try your best and and want to wait until you get to that point where you know you're ready to have kids but accidents happen all the time they do so you can't and you've been there you can't be like i have so you can't be like oh i'm i'm ready now when like something happens and you don't know it but we live in a country that gives people the option to uh, how do i say not bear the responsibility of their direct mistake yeah in that sense and you, I mean, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want. I mean, you put it on social I'm media. Fine. Yeah. So you talked about I'm it. I'm not fine, but I'm definitely more willing to talk about it. Yeah. Why did you Why did you decide to put it on the on social media? Um, I wanted to do it for a while because... And, and let's, we, for people listening, I have no idea. What, oh, probably yeah. <laughs> what, the context of what we're talking about. Do you want to explain what we're talking about? Sure. Um, so early 2019, January, I had an abortion from a seven-week pregnancy that I found out about um, wasn't the right time for me and yeah it's been a long road um, still with the same partner and um, obviously weren't expecting it um, I have no regrets from aborting it um, some people say they regret it I don't have any regrets but it took me a long time to to post it on social media just because well, it wasn't because I thought people didn't need to hear about it. It wasn't because I felt uncomfortable about it. It was just like, is the world going to care? There's so much information out there. And there's so many things that I scroll past, like that people post that I know come from a very heartfelt place. And I will start reading and I'll be like, eh. And I'm like, well, if no one cares about it, then what's the point of posting it because you're not helping anyone? But then I was kind of like, well, fuck it. Like, there's going to be one or two pe- people out there that are going to read that. And like, even if it's just one person, exactly, then like... It's worth it. It's worth it. So I was just like, whatever, I'll, I'll just write it. So I did. There's been heaps of times where I've gone to write it and then just been like, no, who was going to read that? But, but yeah, I was just like, whatever. On that, does it, I mean, it depends on your intent, right? If your intent is to solely make a positive influence, your intent is just to express and document yourself honestly and openly. Mm. Does it? My question is: Does it matter? Does the idea matter? How much people care about it, and why does it matter, and why does it not? Oh no, it doesn't. Why should you care what other people think about it? Like it, that's their view, and no, I don't think. I don't think. I think I did the right thing. Um, but it takes you a while to get over your expectation on what you think other people will think from what yeah. you wrote like yeah. you want people to um to read it and like acknowledge it and um you know maybe change it will help change some of some part of their life in some way 
But there are obviously going to be people out there who just like scroll right past it. And like, it's like, I had to be comfortable with knowing that there are going to be people who start reading that and be like, fuck that. And then keep going on. Like to scroll and down. And that's their prerogative. That's their thing. Like they haven't been through it. Why should I expect someone who's like, I got people on my Facebook from my hometown who are like a lot younger than me. Like maybe they're like 20 or 19 and like they're boys. I'm like, what? Like, why should I expect them to sit and read that whole post about it? Like they're not going to do that. And like, I don't care if they do or don't. And like, you have to be comfortable with people like not caring about everything that you say or do. And not fulfilling your expectations. Yeah. Because I think the root of a lot of voluntary suffering and pain and anguish we go through is through our expectations. We create these mental uh, bars uh, represented as expectations and we expect others to fit through them and conform through them. Yeah. And we do it sometimes, and I know I have, without even communicating effectively what those expectations are. Now, it's not to say you shouldn't have expectations. I think what's more important is boundaries and standards. What are the boundaries that you will and won't allow? And what are the standards to which you want to and aim to live your life with? I think that's the distinction um, that we all must make. Remember when I asked you if you read the Don Miguel Ruiz books? Yeah. A while ago? Yeah. Um, he talks about that, a lot of that stuff. He writes... Pull that mic. You don't have to get closer to it. You can just point it towards your mouth. I'm just like sitting really far away. Yeah, I'm but getting if comfy it's, over here. If it's good. <laughs> I'm like leaning back. <laughs> get comfortable. Um, he, his main book is called The Four Agreements. Um, talks about like four agreements that people should try and follow their lives by. It's from old Toltec wisdom, which I will not try and repeat because I will Toltec? butcher it. Yeah. I'm going to try and butcher it, but basically kind of like um, the base of what I can remember and I don't want to say it incorrectly is that like people assume that people are living a reality and they dream all the time to reach a certain point of their life where they think that they'll have success and they will be happy only when they reach that level. But like Toltec wisdom is like you are already living the dream. So like your life is a dream. You should be present rather than be focusing on like I need to get here. Only will I get here will I be happy when a lot of the times that journey from thinking that you need to be a certain way is quite miserable and you end up being miserable for a very long time and you might not even get to that point. And when you get to that point, what are you going to do when you've got there and you don't like it? And like that's why people who become famous, they get to a point where they're like, I'm, I'm still not happy. When Toltec Wisdom, obviously I don't know all about it, but from the basis is like, your whole life is a dream. So try and be present in everything that you do rather than waiting for the next thing to happen or um <sighs> yeah chasing the next thing <laughs> yeah There's but the next. so the, f- the first book's about these four agreements um they are be impeccable with your word be honest that's not the second one that's just like you know a definition of like be impeccable with your word just be truthful and honest and um don't say things that you really wouldn't say to that you wouldn't say to someone like behind in front of their face like behind their back and then the second one is um don't take things personally like and then um be immune to the opinions of others and avoid needless suffering which one are you reading agreement two don't take anything personally yeah don't take anything personally um always do your best i don't keep forgetting the fourth one i always do that is the fourth one are we going in order always do your best number four (laughs) always do your best i literally just read this the other day and the third one be impeccable with your word Always do your best. Don't take anything personally. Oh, don't make assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. I actually have it written on my phone, <laughs> but I'm not looking at my phone. Avoid misunderstandings by communicating properly. Find courage to express yourself and ask questions. Yeah, it's on my phone. <laughs> Amazing. Those are tenets. Those are those are things to live by. Yeah, they're great. The, the, I read that book a long time ago. I read that book about a year after I moved to Melbourne and had like a whole bunch of things going on so it was a little bit applicable but uh, and i tried to follow it for a little bit and then life got in the way and then i reread it and then um so now i'm like really trying to like put these into my life every single day but i think when i first read it i was trying to do everything perfectly i was like you have to do all four of them right every single day and it's so difficult it's so difficult it takes years and years and years so now i've reread the book and another book by him um it's taken me some time to realize you don't have to do all of them perfectly all the time like I find there's going to be some that resonate more with you and resonate more with me. Like, don't take anything personally is really hard for me, especially, like, in my relationship. It's taken me a lot of t- 
time to like realize like what you're saying actually yeah i don't need to take it personally it's something that is to, this your thing and like it has a lot has of people project yeah. their own insecurities and experiences and biases onto others yeah um see for me be impeccable with your word and always do your best extremely important to me and be impeccable with your word and not just be honest but be deliberate and careful with your speech mm. and like that's look at what we're doing look what i'm doing I, I fucking all i do is talk right all we do is talk and i have all these podcasts and i have hundreds of hours of me just talking right how how much of that was i being deliberate and attempting to be impeccable with my word. And Jordan Peterson talks about it in 12 Rules for Life. Have you heard about it? Have you read that book? I've got the book, but I, I'm only reading one book at a time right now, so I haven't read it now. Right, and he talks about that as well, yeah. um, being very deliberate and uh, careful with your speech. Yeah. It does say be impeccable with your word, but the book actually goes into um, practicing how to listen properly. A lot of people don't know how to listen properly. Mm. And a lot of people, are when people speak to them, they're listening. They list like my air quotes, like they're listening, but they're also thinking about what they're going to say to that. Oh, man. You're always just like... Like, right now, like we've probably done it like over and over again each time we say something to each other right now. We're like, what can I say next that will, like, continue this conversation? I mean, really, you should just be listening to what that person's saying so you can understand it That's properly. it. And I'm just doing it right now because I'm excited for, for a <laughs> moment. You get it, right? You get exciting thoughts. Yeah. And I think when you can get into a really nice flow is when it's just a continuous momentum rolling down a hill slightly, right? Mm. And I think it's another really important component part is being comfortable and with the uncomfortable nature of pausing yeah and silence silence is so much fun sometimes i'm silent with my partner when we're having a really hectic conversation i've never heard someone say that and such it. a smile on their face no because yeah i read something about that it wasn't in that book but it was something about it, it was just like watch maybe it's even a podcast that i was listening to but it was just like watch <laughs> what people do when you don't reply to something that they've said like of course don't do it if they oh you do it all the time if they <laughs> She would all the time. Don't if do you it. message Casey Drew, she's not gonna. Rep- she's gonna see it and she'll reply <laughs> to it. You said my full name. <laughs> of course I did. It's gonna be on the podcast. Oh, if there's a problem. That's all, G. Um, I put the full names of all the people. That's fine. It's a very common name. I mean, I'm very famous. It's gonna affect. You're life. a you're a triple Z <laughs> celebrity. Oh, I yeah. am. Um, yeah, I. It's interesting. Like, obviously, someone asks you a question. Like, don't be a dickhead and just sit there and be silent. But if they say something and it, maybe you're having a conversation that could be something that's like a little bit uncomfortable like let them say their statement don't reply and then like see how they build on that statement because sometimes yeah with each time they continue talking about something they could uncover something that they would never have said well uh, uncover sorry uncover a feeling that they never would have felt if they hadn't said that sentence so like it's really interesting letting silence be part of the conversation it's good i do it with my partner all the time Sometimes I don't let him know that, but I do it with my partner all the time. It's good. It's a skill to practice because I, it's like conversations like a, it's like a back and forth flow. And I think it's really good you're trying to do that. I think it's such a practical thing people can do to improve the quality of their connections with people. Mm. And when you're having conversations with people especially in these types of contexts where i have no script and plan for this conversation Uh, uh, neither do you Mm. i have no list of questions i've said hey casey do you want to come on my podcast you said yes and that's it yeah but under the guise of these this equipment sitting here or even if there wasn't here i think people get in their head it's like uh, I got to fill the space and I think it's such an important point you made is that when you give people the space to not jump in to the next thought because you say you say you say something you finish a sentence and I, I hear one second pause and I'm into the next one yeah. I might start a new topic but you don't know what I don't know what was on the other side of that pause and on that thought mm. And it's a mistake I, I, I've made many times and it's difficult because you don't want to force discomfort on people, but at the same time, you want to create space. 
Yeah, like you don't want people to think, oh, uh, Casey just doesn't say anything all the time. It's really weird and annoying. Um, but I think you uh, would be like, you'd obviously know when that was happening. Like you'd know if you were just like, I actually haven't said anything for a long time and it's a bit weird. Um, yeah. But I think it See, would that's be an example right there, just there. Yeah. I, I could have, boom, I could have just jumped in right there. Mm. But like, like you got to like let her breathe. Mm. Nah, I fucked you up your thought though. <laughs> so it's ironic. I, mean, I was still thinking what I was what I was gonna say, but <laughs> <laughs> you didn't fuck me up with my thought. Um, I find it I don't really use it in like um my like work life as much, but I would use it um in terms of like speaking to my partner or like anything to do with relationships or um friendships. I find it, but when I'm at work, it's a bit different. It's well, it's more transactional when you're is, at work. It is. So it's hard to. It's got a job to do. You got time to be nice and cordial. Yeah, Joking. but it, but you can get far in work if you just were a little bit nice. If everyone's just a little bit nice, like oh, yeah. I see it work all the time when people appreciate s- another staff member who's just a little bit more nicer than maybe not what I am. Maybe they haven't spoke to me, but like when a staff member actually says like, "Oh, how was your day?" and like they're not used to a question, you normally just get, "Hey, how are you?" Like, "Good." Okay, yeah. good. But like when. How was your day? When you say like, oh, what'd you get up to this morning? Or like, did you, did you travel far this morning? Then they're like, this is a different question. But they leave with like... <laughs> I'm not prepared for I this non-robotic <laughs> conversation. But they, but they enjoy it. And it's because a lot of people don't have proper conversations with people anymore. Like everything feels very transactional throughout the day, especially in a place like Melbourne where um, there are a lot of nine to fivers, a lot of people that are out of their house all day because they're at work. And like all their, conversation that, all their conversations that they're having are probably going to be very transactional. So it's nice to not have a conversation like that sometimes. And I see it when some other staff members that I work with, if they're like a little bit more nicer, they'll get further with that customer and that customer will like invest more money or whatever it is. Because like I work in in promo in events, so we could be doing something different all the time. But um, they'll invest more with that person just because they're a little bit nicer. So... But I think what's important is that your intent isn't to get something like you're not being nice uh, yeah. because you expect them to do something for you yeah like it's got to come from a genuine place yes. like there are people who are just genuinely lovely every day and they love to have conversations with people every day and working thank you <laughs> Alex um, and working in events um, I work with a lot of people like that because almost all of them are actors so they love to talk they know a lot about pop culture so they have like a lot of knowledge about like things that people want to talk about and they are very outgoing. They love to create conversation. So they're not silent. They're not like quiet. So they're very like, oh, hi, how are you going? Like they ask the questions all the time and they'll be like, and they will be almost always be the people to initiate the conversation with the customer. And maybe myself, like I maybe would have just chilled there and just be happy with saying, hey, how are you going? But I can tell that that customer is way more happy that they've received a response like that from a staff member who's just a bit more nicer. And that, that could be done the reverse way. Like, we can all seep that into our daily conversations and connections with people. Yeah. Like we can all, I mean, like, shit, be the change you want to see. So I should really lead in this way. But no one sees these things. Like, or not, not no one, but it's like, it's just the habits you do when no one's watching kind of thing. Like, sometimes no one sees how you interact with the person who, um, at, at the petrol station or gas station, who mm. you pay money to. Right? Um but making that small talk, jokes, or humoring them. How many times do you, uh, it's interesting, like we don't even look the people in the eye sometimes when people serve us. Yeah. You know, we don't like make eye contact with them, especially people at gas stations who I think are treated like, I think we, we subconsciously treat them like, like they're just a part of the walls, like they're a part of the system, that they're, they're machines. It's like, that's oh, a human. Wait, that's a person. Yeah. I pay money, go now, buy. Yeah. Like, that's it. I mean, it's, it's the most fleeting. F plus, beep, done, yeah. buy. It's the quickest transaction yeah. in person mm. in society, is it? Mm. I assume in so. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I would really, I would really, if, I, if that was me and I had my character and I had to forced into the job like that, I would really try and have fun with it. But you'd have to. Like go crazy. With oh, I would. I would be. I'd put. If I couldn't get fired, I would. I'd, like when I worked in retail. Mm. I, th- I think. I think. I think I would dance at times. I would. I would play music that was, 
um, I enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, that maybe I wasn't allowed to at times. Um, that had cursing in it because you know, cursing's the devil, and you obviously never want to swear because. Um, because no one swears, and we're all very good, and we yeah. don't do things like that. So no. why would you play music that is swearing? You know? No, God. You know, Blast you don't want to offend people with. In Chadston. Sounds with their five thousand dollar Gucci bags. Yeah, it's very expensive. <laughs> don't offend them; they can get very angry. Of course, they'll throw <laughs> your Gucci bag at you. Um, but we have gone off, and we have taken a massive detour to explaining um, the situation with your. Abortion. Yes. So. Yes. You. We, were, we, we were talking. <laughs> we went to talk about um, people's expectations, and I asked you why you decided to put it mm. out there, and then you talked about um, you had to just let go of caring about caring what people about think. Caring about people's responses. And you just put it out there. Yeah, and because when I did at the time when I started telling people about it after it happened, um, there was three four it was four girls that i told and out of the four two of them i had it and i didn't even know that's half that's already half the people that i had told apart from apart from my partner but i was like shit i was like okay well um more common than you suspect huh well the stat is one in three what's the age group oh i don't know australian i don't know that either so here's the problem (laughs) with fucking stats you need to keep diving deeper I'll, I'll get you. Abortion <laughs> statistics, Australia. Um, I would assume definitely people below 30. So, okay. And pro-choice, correct me if I'm wrong, pro-choice is the um, ability for a woman to choose uh, whether she gives birth or not, right? Yeah. Pro-life is you should keep the baby at all, at all times. Yeah. Is there any cutoff? Is there any leeway? I don't think so. I think okay. it's like just say even if you you realize no, and that's what some people have a problem with pro life supporters because you know you might find out that your baby has a illness in the womb that yep. means that when they are born they they are a, you know a vegetable. So like, what do you do at that point? And uh, this is the thing. I'm not a woman. I don't know if you have you've been able to tell uh, from listening or seeing me, guys and girls. Um, I mean, you have quite long. I, it, can, it can get pretty long if I take it out. How long is it right now? Uh, you know, in the shower, though, everything gets longer, but um, everything. Um, <laughs> it goes down to about shoulder, a bit longer than shoulder. I am. Uh, we're going to keep it going. Yeah. Until the time is right. Um, the rate of abortion, uh, abortion figures, mm. uh, reliable abortion data is hard to come by. And that makes sense, right? Yeah. It's because New South Wales and Vic and Queensland don't keep statistics on abortion. Only South Australia publishes figures. Abortion data is therefore estimated from South Australian, Western Australia and Northern Territory from Medicare rebates. You get Medicare rebates from the, from like getting the abortion pill? Based on the data, it is estimated 70 to 80,000 abortions occur annually. This means that one in four pregnancies end in abortion and one in... And a third to a quarter of women will have an abortion. Yeah. Did you say that's just it? that's just data from the pill? The abortion pill? No, I was making an assumption. Uh-huh. I don't know. I'd need to look at the studies. Yeah. Uh, there is evidence of a reduction rate in the recent years. In South Australia, there was a peak of 17.9 abortions per thousand women in 1999. All right. So it's quite common. In a woman's lifetime, 70 to 80,000. And I think the argument of, you know, if my, if my child has a debilitating neurological or physiological um, disease, mm. and there are a lot. Mm. Like, you don't realize. You, you think of the obvious ones, ADHD. Um, sorry, not, that's dumb of me. I misspoke. Um, you know what I'm going to say. It starts with an A. Autism. Yeah. Um, but there are so many. Well, cerebral palsy or something like that. There you go. There's another Depending one. Depending on the severity of cerebral palsy. And all different types of like pretty uncommon, rare rare ones uh, that are hard to detect as well. Yeah. So I think the problem about these arguments is they're black or white, right? Pro-life, pro-choice. Mm. You got to pick a side. You got to pick. Which team are you on? Yeah. Are you on team orange man? Or team non-orange man, <laughs> right? 
or Biden or Trump. See, I know the opposing person to Trump. I don't know the opposing guy to um, our prime minister. Oh, she doesn't know either. Wouldn't it be um, Bill Shorten? Who's that? Is he still the leader of the Labour Party? I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. And people are getting mad at me because I don't understand politics. And I'm saying, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Mm. I don't know a lot about politics. Anyway. That's why I don't work in government. <laughs> so don't oh, worry about that it. Sounds like, <laughs> that sounds like a life soul sucking job. Just tr- trying to fit in a perfect mold of who, of trying to be the the person that they want you to be and they need you to be. And yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. Fuck all of that. Some people love it, though. Well, love what about it? Human, uh, give me some perspective. Like, I think it's interesting listening to people talk about why anyone would ever want to be a leader of a country. You get, I get why. I just think it's dumb. You think it's dumb? I think it's dumb to have one person. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's very dumb. Sorry, to have I think one. it's ineffective. Just to have one person. One person is, yeah, very silly. Like. I think we should have a cabinet of experts on each topic that gets oh, we do. somewhat distributed so proportion kind of to vote on yeah. issues with like leaders of like finance and leaders of um, economy and like leaders of like health ministers and stuff like that. That's why they've got like the treasurer and the, the international relations minister and all those kind of things. That's, that's what they're there for. And these are my ignorance then. How much power do they get to make decisions? Well, f- I don't know. Someone who works in politics, please <laughs> come on out. and educate me <laughs> right now. Come on and educate uh, because it's an important subject. Um, but I th- I imagine it like like a cabinet, like you see in a movie, you'll see like a cabinet of like like a whole row mm. of like uh, elders and experts yeah. who they'll, they'll come to for counsel, yeah. like in Star Wars or something. I'm pre- but then if those people have opposing views, then there has to be one person who decides... Hmm. Yeah, or no at the end of the day. Does there or could it just be a vote? Well, it could be. I feel like this is already our government. We just don't know enough about it. Maybe. Ma- maybe. Uh, but yeah, the question is like, cause it's, it's, it's tough because you always see one person representing and talking about these decisions. But what we don't see in them is all the downstream uh, people who yeah. influence that decision. Like Mr. Um, Scott Morrison is presenting this information he's going to present tomorrow the changes that are going to happen which we're all eagerly excited to hear it's tomorrow friday what's the date thursday what i thought it was the 11th i'm here on friday i, we d- I just did a big group chat with a bunch of coaches a webinar and um the they said friday oh there you go we're all wrong if it's not tomorrow Shit. so we're all eagerly awaiting what's mm. going to happen yeah and he would get all that information from x amount of people yeah and even the way that he presents that information is written by a speechwriter. So like, it's true. He's just a communicator. It's like a fa- yeah, it's like a communicator and a face. But you, you want that communicator to be, if you're going to have the head guy, you want that guy to be like a strong, a strong uh, leader and speaker as possible. You want someone who represents like what it is to be a, an excellent human being would you not sounds like a good idea yeah i mean every time when we have because australia has had so many different leaders and i feel like the past six years they're normal i'm not too sure but you know we just swap around a lot for a little bit there and when i didn't and i sort of don't know enough about government and politics but when they first do their first conference or whatever one thing that i w- almost always say is like they speak well or they don't speak well and if they speak well, you like make up these assumptions. I shouldn't be making assumptions, but I have of like how assertive they're going to be. We should judge on appearance, though. We should. I, I, I dis- I, I, yes, I think that's a part of it. I don't think we shouldn't judge on appearance. I think appearance is critical. Well, that's another thing in the book is like, it's not just don't make assumptions about anything. Don't, you know, just like let your guard down and completely, you know, let people walk all over you or like, no, because you, you need to know when you're in a dangerous situation as well. So you have to assume sometimes. But for the most part, the assumptions that we make are not, they're yeah. not necessary and they are, m- are wrong they're most, illogical. most of the yeah, time. Yeah, 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 great, yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. But obviously, like, 100%, if you're in a dangerous situ- situation, then you need to make assumptions because you need to get out. But um, was, I'm saying, though, that appearances is all you have sometimes. So you have to judge on appearances and how someone speaks and how someone presents themselves yeah. when that's all you know because that, and that's going to give you really important information, I think. Like... 
what was so impressive about Barack Obama, I don't know his policies, people are going to disagree about that. I'm just, let's just talk about him as a person and his character. He was a, he was a very well-spoken man. He presented himself very professionally. Mm. He, was, he appeared patient, non-emotional. Uh, he appeared like he, he genuinely cared. And he appeared like he cared about his health too, which I think is a really important component. Like I read something, he, he, t- he made the time to exercise 30 minutes every day. There's f- videos and photos of him running with these like security guards. And that He prided himself on that because mm. I think uh, you don't, it doesn't inspire confidence when you see a weak, feeble, ill-spoken, um, unattractive uh, man or woman who is in poor health. It doesn't give anyone confidence that they are going to lead us all to a better world. Yeah. If they can't lead their own life and character to a better world. Yeah. And um, I think Barack Obama also showed a sense of humor as well, which some people really yeah, yeah good point. They really enjoy, but not to a point where like it's like this guy's just a joker. He's just joking all the time. He had the right amount of. He kind of found like the right amount of of everything. He's just the, um, he's the perfect man, isn't he? Well, Just whereas like want to take you, you with the health stuff, like whereas Trump right now, people look at Trump and there was something getting around about him having heart disease or something. Cool. Did you see that? I didn't, but I wouldn't be surprised. They're going to keep that under under wraps. He had like some score on some test that was like ridiculous, like way out of it. Like he already <laughs> oh basically goodness. has heart disease. And like, Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. That's not good. Why do we laugh? So we laugh at the orange man he's, getting he's, sick. And also it's disgusting. What you were saying about, you know, you don't want to be watching someone who speaks ill of other people, whereas Trump does that quite a fair bit. He's funny. He I don't, he, pay, I don't give him my time. He is like, he's like doing comedy routines up there sometimes. Like he he throws jabs. He'll he'll go in. He knows how to um play the game. Have you seen the video that someone made? And it's him saying that he's like, oh, what is he? he always uses the one line. He's like, if anyone knows anything about something, it's me. And then like, but he said that with like all these different topics. So he's like. If anyone knows anything about gun control, it's me. If anyone knows anything about fucking, I don't know, abortions, it's me. Yeah, and then yeah, someone's yeah. made a compilation of him say it with like all these different things. And it's like way too ridiculous. And you're like, he just uses the same line all the time. It's great. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's what I get it. You, you, you've got a leader and they want to inspire their viewers and their citizens that they, are, they know what they're doing. Mm. So, of course, they're going to say that. And they're going to be told by experts below them. That they f- so they feel like that they're informed and educated, mm. um, but there's just there's so many clips and memes that capture these moments of hilarity of the world we're living in and the leaders that we have in our countries. But when you have a camera on someone all the time, they're gonna they're gonna say shit that's gonna be weird and awkward and funny and wrong. Yeah. Especially if you put them in a situation like COVID-19 where oh, yeah. they would never think they'd ever be a leader in a situation like this. Ever this is like a war. Mm. So a war against an invisible enemy. Mm-hmm. And every single human has a common enemy. When's the last time that happened? Yeah. Tell me. The last infectious disease. <laughs> yeah. Most yeah. Uh, but none of... Oh, in the last... This is probably... This is one of the biggest infectious disease since the... Since HIV and AIDS has killed more, but it's been more ongoing. But we're talking like since like the Hong Kong flu um, in the 80s. Like we're talking like decades. This is becoming the biggest from a case yeah. cases and deaths. I think um, Ebola was big, but it didn't kill a lot of people because it was uh, contained within a certain area in Africa. They were quite well at containing Ebola. Ebola was very deadly from my recollection, but it didn't have a... It wasn't very spreadable. You, there was a very short time frame. It was a much shorter time frame um, where you presented symptoms mm. and you got sick and died. But I think swine flu was big in India. I think they had a big issue with swine flu in India. Like yeah, I'm looking at 200,000 uh, de- uh, deaths. Deaths. 200,000 deaths from swine flu in 2009 and 2010. Yeah, and there's how many has died because of COVID? Oh, more. I'll tell you right now. Let's do let's do the little live John Hopkins um, University map update. Have you have you seen that? It's a no. really. I haven't actually updated myself with how many deaths there are in Australia lately. Australia's doing real well, but let me give you the world. Uh, I'm doing real well in comparison to other countries. Yeah. To majority, especially New Zealand too. Um, 
just loading it up now. I used to check this every day. Now I'm doing it less, but we're looking at 3.75 million cases, 263,000 global deaths. 3.75 million cases worldwide. Total confirmed, yes. Yeah, total confirmed. So, so there's you been. Don't actually know how many are out there, but yeah. Yeah, because it's always more. Yeah. The case, it's cases is usually always more because testing lags behind actual reality, mm. um, and you're not going to record all the cases because it's going to be people who are asymptomatic and don't get tested. Yeah. Uh, moreover, is what's gr- it's great what I think we're doing now. We're opened up free testing to people. You can do drive-throughs and get tested, mm. um, which is awesome. But in the same vein, uh, you're not going to record all the deaths. And there's been it's been noted many times. Uh, for example, in the UK, if I recall correctly, they're not recording nursing home deaths. Why, I don't know. Okay. And where, where are they not doing that, sorry? In the UK. In the UK. Okay. Uh, moreover, yeah. um, you can fact check me, but uh, yeah. Moreover, um, there are people who are dying in their homes who aren't getting recorded and aren't tracking to the actual death of the coronavirus because they didn't die in a hospital. Yeah. Another is that people, uh, they're dying of other complications that may get attributed to something else. Yeah. Like wouldn't there be people if they already have, you know, maybe they've got some kind of cardiovascular issue and they end up getting COVID and then they end up having a heart attack, but the cause of death is heart attack. Yeah. And, and every really that that was brought on by COVID. And every country reports slightly differently. Yeah. Which makes it, comp- it, it makes it quite complex. So I, don't, I think what should be, what they, all these statistics and what John Hopkins should do is a range. They should do a range instead of an absolute number because a range indicates uh, that we, and a range indicates that we don't know 100%, which is correct. A mm. range, like a confidence interval. Do you remember confidence intervals from statistics? Yeah, basically, kind of. So we're 95% sure within a certain range of data yeah. um, that this is the accurate data. Yeah. So if we did confidence intervals for this, I think it would give more reliable data. Um, but we're, if you just think back, like how different this world was two months ago, mm. three months ago, like in March 15... 2020 guess how many cases this world had and i'm going to give you in weeks march 15 if you're listening take a number in your head so that's one sorry let me do it like this one month jesus march 15 is not that long ago wow uh, yeah well it's not even april 15th yet so it is no it's, Wait, it's may, may, may shit it's not even may 15th yet so sorry. that's one two so that's just under seven weeks Seven weeks ago, how many cases were in there in the world? Uh, wasn't that peak? Was that peak? Peak? Peak what? Peak, like... Peak spreadability? Oh, COVID, yeah. <laughs> what was that a little bit later on? Probably end of March was probably peak. I couldn't even, I couldn't even hazard a guess, to be honest. 6,400. 6,400... Total cases. Total cases. T- total confirmed cases. I'm so sorry. Oh, well, Fuck. Okay, shit. I fucked it. What's happening? Deaths. <laughs> deaths. Sorry. 6,400 deaths. Worldwide. Worldwide. Holy shit. Seven weeks later. And when, when, when around March, this is when people were telling me and saying, saying to the pop, it's just the flu. It's, it's not nothing. worse than the flu. It's fine. It's just a, everybody's overblowing it. And some people were over panicking. Yeah. Some people were in the middle. So I'm, And this is the point. The point is you have to look at projections. You have to look at uh, worst case scenarios. You have to look at best case and you have to look in the middle. And you have to prepare for each scenario if you want to be ultimately prepared for the uncertainties of life. Yes. Because when okay. when it was... <laughs> My question is not even that important. <laughs> Are any questions important? Some of them. Okay. Mine was not. <laughs> 6.4 thousand cases, I bet a, lo- a lot of people were not thinking in just seven weeks, if I told you that nearly 3,000, 300,000 people would have died from this disease, uh, I don't think a lot of them would take that seriously. We were told that though, weren't we? We have been given projections by many experts. Mm. But, but at the time, I think people just thought they were so outrageous. Yes. And it wasn't going to happen. And some people, some people overblew it. Some people went too far. It's like, oh, that's inaccurate. Yeah. Like talk millions of deaths. Some people thought there would be millions of deaths by now. Yeah. 
there's so many factors that determine this. Yeah, especially with our country as well. Like, almost any assumption that's been made about our country has been over, over assumed because we haven't got as many deaths as anyone thought that we would have. I feel like, are we still less than 100? 97. 97. Mm. Yeah. 6,400 deaths in March 15. Now, uh, sitting at much, much more. What do you think is going to happen? Um, with Australia? Or just any, in Both general? Both Australia and the world. I was thinking the other day a, a point about New Zealand's way they've gone about it, which is I didn't really think too much. Um because I just everything that you read about New Zealand's way of dealing with COVID is like very positive, but then I was reading like, oh, they actually are making a country that has no immunity. So, yep, they're relying on no active cases. Yeah, and they're um, relying on a vaccine being made. As many are as we all are in some ways. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, and just the concept of herd immunity really interests me. Well, for those who don't know, herd immunity, and I might get the percentages wrong, you might correct me, herd immunity assumes that 50 to 60% yeah. percent minimum of the population need one disease uh, to ad- infer enough immunity to the rest of the population where the spreadability uh, is diminished enough to not cause like a dramatic um, uh, uprising cases and deaths. I think it's enough where herd immunity infers that the, the spreadability drops below... 1.00 oh i don't know about that percentage i just know that like there should be at least like 50 60 percent of people yeah um put back into the community um to stimulate obviously economic growth and just the functioning of this country getting back to normal again um that's one way to do it but then people die and then yes. if you're a leader who introduces that and you're the only leader that introduces that and it doesn't work and you're on the chopping block, like yeah, it's unethical. Now it's basically just you've just allowed these people go out there for slaughter. F- for the, the short-term pain, long-term gain is is the game that is, right? But it's a lot of short-term pain. Yeah, because the worst kind of short-term pain. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's people's lives. Yeah. But it's also on the, on the same vein, people talking about this uh, this experience with the restrictions that is that is impacting people's lives to a similar extent people feel i'm talking the anxiety sh- and stress of losing your job and maybe and not being able to financially support yourself and also it's like people's work gives them meaning and fulfillment yeah you take that away from somebody and you take away a source of their joy and pleasure in life mm. well that's why um another point about when we're talking a while ago about the um, the marches in America and um, the latest one not the la- I don't know if it was the latest but the one I was talking about where um, the nurses are on the front line literally stopping stopping the protests um, a lot of the people that were doing the protests yes there were some of them that were like the argument was plainly this is in breach of our of our freedom like we shouldn't be made to stay inside all day um, like no real actual proper argument and um, sense of maturity i guess um to their argument they were just there because they just like they just want to get out of their house that was the only reason why but then the other, and they were just like you know covid isn't a thing it's not even real it's like the government made it up like just, just silly yeah, yeah, very that, silly yeah, things those are things heard like the people that were like that but then there were other people in the same march who were just like we recognize that this is happening we know that it's happening yes we are doing all the measures that we can but also at the same time like we need to go out back into the community. My mom needs to go back to work because she needs to support our whole family. And like, that's why we want to get out, but we're going to do it um, with the most, like the- Safety precautions and yeah, like common sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they're going possible. to go back to work and not be silly about being out in public like some people would be. Like they're not, you're not going to see them at a bar or something like that. They just want to get out because they want to go to work because they have no money. And if someone gets sick in their family or someone might already be sick in their family and I don't know what's going on with America's healthcare system, but it's not like ours. And so that's what they're worried about. And um, yeah, so I think like, um, yeah, that was like, that was really surprising. It's like some people who were just like so silly and just thought that it was... um not real it's not a legitimate thing here's the problem about news outlets in that sense that they portray and it's not even entirely their fault because it's the individual's judgment 
poor judgment as well. You assume that America's like this. Mm. This is what America's like. It, it's it's like uh, all people are like this, and they spread all these these ideas to people, um, and they have these such poor judgment and critical thinking. Uh, but it's not. It's often a minority that represents those thoughts. It's often not the majority. Does that make sense? It's often the small group. Yeah, that this just happens to be that small group, usually very loud. V- exactly, very loud, yeah. and they get a lot of coverage. Yeah, and so people begin to make assumptions that that's the majority of people. Yeah, but that is for those people. They wholeheartedly believe, and well, they have been indoctrinated to believe that the causes and origins and the the circumstances of this virus are not are real or they're not they're overblown dramatically and that's what they believe and they're entitled to believe that but the problem becomes when your beliefs ca- can turn into actions that can harm indirectly mm. other people yeah because this is a systemic problem meaning your our behaviors can influence others yeah if i spread it to somebody they can spread it to another they can spread it to somebody who can die yeah so that those ra- those consequences because the consequences are so large is why I think we have such heavy restrictions. The consequences are so high. Yeah. I want yeah, I don't know where we get to the point where we might have to do herd immunity, hopefully not, but just the concept of it is very like interesting to me. Why? I don't know, I just I f- Well, one I fully didn't understand what it meant until someone explained it to me uh, a few weeks ago. Um and their, the way they explained it to me was like, it kind of made you think like, we should just be doing it. <laughs> like we should, yeah. Um, I'm not like pro herd immunity. I'm not saying like what the government do- is doing right now is wrong. Um, but it's very interesting. It's a very interesting solution. Um, it is because it is a s- essentially a solution. Mm. Uh, but it makes some assumptions. It makes assumptions that your medical system can handle it. And most, a lot can't. To yeah. be overwhelmed in that short amount of time, to have the beds, the ICU capacities, um, the PPE equipment. Uh, moreover, it assumes that it assumes that mutation won't occur to a significant enough extent, um, that your immunity won't be valid. Yeah. But what what are we going to do? We have to operate. If we're going to make a decision, we have to operate on some educated well, assumptions. That's the same thing. You could say that with the vaccine though as well. Correct. Like, so this may vaccine. be seasonal. Yeah. And there's going to be mutation. Then we're going to go through the same shit. Like again. influenza like, A and B. What's well, like, what? What? <laughs> the only problem is if you've got a vaccine that's already based on the original disease and it's easier to, f- to, to create a new vaccine based off that. Right. To adu- to be able to be effective for that mutation. Right. Um, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was very interesting. And like um, thinking about if we were to do herd immunity and the people that would unfortunately pass away because of that, um, yes, it would be very short term, but we would miss out on a lot of the deaths that will happen from this. So like what you were saying before, like was like depression and people who um, maybe like what we're talking about even earlier, it was like childhood trauma and like people, kids who are stuck in their homes that are like getting sexually abused and then eventually they will like lead to depression. Um, Possibly, they might not. But whereas that's a long-term thing and it's not measurable and so people, yeah, we just don't really know what solution is better because everything is hypothetical. A lot of it is. It's based on, it's based on some of it's based on research, but it's based off research that is from short-term data, incomplete data from certain regions. It's really difficult because we're so early in this. Mm. And to make these comparisons of what is the better decision to do, there are so many what we call second and third order consequences. So you have one order of consequence that is a more direct consequence. And then you have the things you're talking about, suicide, depression, childhood trauma. like, And then the other side of herd immunity has its own. Um, it, it mean, meaning if we open the floodgates and let people do what they want and we just recommend people who are at high risk stay at home. Mm. There's so many second, third order consequences downstream from each one. Yeah. Ha- you know how complicated it would be to make a fair comparison? Yeah. Like you would need some... That's a huge graph. And then that's why you have leaders who are like, fuck, let's just wait it out because but, I can't make that call right now because there's too many things going on. But we know that if we get a vaccine, 
it'll help. <laughs> but you know what? If we discussed that, if we just said that, that if you explain what we're talking about right now, you know what? There are so many, there are hundreds of downstream variables that are so hard to control. This is the best decision that we can make because we we can't or can not risk uh, those those variables that mm. we, uh, we don't fully understand. So I just think it's, I think that conversation needs should be had. I think that's why a lot of people talk about um, what's the New Zealand Prime Minister again? She's a female something. Um, She's, I'm not sure her name. But I think that's the conversation that she had. I think that was like basically her message to New Zealand. And they're like, we can't do herd immunity because we don't have enough resources. We like look at our tiny right. country. We don't have anything. So we have. That's why we have to go with the alternate. Shout out to Jacinda, Jacinda Ardern. Ar- Ardern. Yeah, just just Jacinda Ardern. Well, but um, yeah, so. I think that's I think that's actually the message that she sent to the country. She was just like open and honest, and was just like, we can't do herd immunity. We don't have enough hospitals. We don't have enough resources. Fair enough. We're not going to be able to get them in, so we need to do it this way. Otherwise, we're kind of screwed. And so, uh, let's have a look what th- what they're on, um, because th- they've had I think zero active cases um, for a period of time. I will check as soon as I can. Are there still, there's still people on cruise ships, though. How crazy is I that? I know, right? You forget about them, don't you? You're like, shit, you're some still people on, on ship. Year-long, like, some people do year-long cruises. Like, this is these wealthy, like, people. Mm. And some people, like, hypothesize that all these wealthy people are on a cruise ship somewhere and they really conspired to do all this and they're just hanging out on their cruise ship just waiting till it all ends. Yeah. That's just a fun conspiracy. God, I'm so... That's one thing I'm glad I'm not on. I'm glad I'm not on a cruise oh, ship. Oh, it makes me think... I never really liked the idea of cruise ships, but since hearing more podcasts, hearing people speak about it, seeing the rap, you're stuck on a floating piece of metal through the ocean, right? Mm. Oh, you want to get off? Sorry, there's a giant ocean that spans the horizon. You're not going anywhere, buddy. So, what if anyone's jumped off? Oh, it's happened. People have killed like their, their husbands and wives and they pushed them overboard. What do you mean? Like because of COVID, I mean. No, not just, just on the general. cruise ship. Yeah, yeah. They're just, yeah. I'm done. That's probably the reason why they took them on there anyway. Like yeah, I'm sure nervous. they've conspired to do that. Yeah, some psychopath who's just like, we're going on this cruise. You're all, all close, expenses paid. <laughs> close together in the one space. And the it's just a are petri so dish. It's just you can hear every single thing next door. It's you're all eating the same regurgitated buffet food, which you get sick of after a week. Mm. I wonder if they've closed off all the facilities on the on the ship as well that would make that ship sane for you. Like, for example, huh? like if I was oh. on a cruise ship and I was like, well, the that's okay things. because, you know, there's a gym there and um, there's comedy acts and there's things that I can go see. There's shows. There's always shows on ships. And, like, I've had friends invite me on cruise ships on, like, week-long things. I'm like, I don't want to be stuck on a boat for don't so long. Go. <laughs> a week. Only a week. Yeah. Like, a week. That was uh, for a friend's 30th birthday. And then I have that, I've had other ones where, like, they're 10 days. And I'm like, well, I just really don't want to do that. Just But, but, oh. the, but like, my reasoning of, like, maybe I will go is because, you know, there's a gym there. There's shows you can go see. And they dock and you get off and you get to... We have that on flat ground too. Yeah, I don't know no. if you've noticed. I know. I know. <laughs> That's why I haven't gone on one. Yeah. But like, yeah. I wonder all those things on the cruise ships, are they shut down as well? Are they literally oh, just sitting well, there? If you saw videos and people's anecdotal accounts of their experience, th- they talked about, we're stuck in our rooms all day. We can barely move. We yeah. can't go pretty much anywhere. Yeah. I'm like, who's who's governing this ship? You got like a... Who's, who's the leader, right? Are they really going to... What are you going to do? Oh, actually, you can put them in jail. There's jails on ships. There's, pr- there's what? like, yeah, they, they have like on proper cruise ships. They'll have um, time out corner. <laughs> no, 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 legit. Like if you if you commit a crime, even though it's international waters, sometimes I don't know if you do something like throw your wife overboard and they get you, like um, they, they'll put you in the cruise ship prison, in the right. in the cell. That's real. That's well, real. I mean, yeah, they would need to have one. Of they course. need to isolate them somewhere, don't they? If you think about the statistics of how many people, like how many people are just mentally ill and just pro- have a proclivity towards. Uh, behavior like that yeah right let's say it's call it one out of ten one out of ten it's a lot <laughs> call it one out of a hundred <laughs> call it one out of a thousand how many people on a cruise ship oh, I have no idea thousands thirty thousand can Let's you have fit 30,000 people on a cruise ship? I'm sure you can. How, I'm gonna, this is going to be the most general question of all time. How <laughs> many people fit on a cruise ship? Take your guesses, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, average cruise ship can accommodate 6,000. Oh, damn it. This is almost four times the average size of the ones in the 80s. All right. The largest, oh, Jesus, the Oasis, at over 225,000 GTs are 
How many people? 5,400? Anyway, thousands. There's got to be a couple of just loose loose screws. Yeah. But there'll also be some cruise ships out there that people love and being on that. Like staying there. It's the same with like some people love being at home right now. Some people yeah. really enjoy their time. Other people absolutely are going nuts. So there, I'm sure there would be cruise ships out there. Like some kind of party boat that's just like, oh, okay, well, non-stop party. Let's just do this. Yeah, but you're in the middle of the <laughs> ocean. If anything can go wrong, the ocean don't give a fuck about you or me. I know. Good. Mm. I'm glad. Mm. Now, do you know? Do you know? <laughs> I hope you know. I'm trying to kill the cruise industry with this one podcast. Mm. I think COVID kind of really put a nail in that. Well, you already hear lots of lots of stories about a lot of infectious diseases just spreading so quickly amongst people who go on cruises anyway. Yeah. I mean, this is... And it's the worst demographic. Like, not the worst, but people. like... Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. The most is um, at risk. Absolutely. The worst. Sometimes they can be the worst, but... Jesus. No, it's only... 6,800, the Royal Caribbean International, 2018. 6,600, didn't th- thought it was more. Anyway, that's a lot of people. Uh, it's as many cases almost as we have in Australia. Imagine so if you got seasickness, though, and you were on a cruise ship. You would hope you figured that one out before you went on. Mm. But you didn't know. You just went on first time. Well, I've, I've never been on a cruise ship. But so like you just maybe you don't know. Imagine, yeah, yeah. And you just were on the Surely like, you would and adapt. You're like, well, you know, this is going to only be for a week. It's all right. And we docked on this day and this day. Oh, like, say okay. you went on to like a... Like around Fiji, Vanuatu, that type yeah, of thing. You're getting back on. Yeah, I know, but like, I know, but like, <laughs> just say that was the cruise ship that you originally thought you were going to go on before COVID, and then you got stuck there. But say you were three days in, COVID wasn't a thing yet, and you were like, oh, I feel I'm getting seasick, but it's okay because this will be over in three days, and it's not. No. <laughs> and and you can't get like drugs because you're now on a boat as well. Such limited resources. See the same people every day. <sighs> Every day, all day. I think the limitations outweigh the pros. I mean, just drive over to your next state. You know, that's cool. Take a plane. Even though those, those, that's pretty crazy too. Going a huge metal contraption that's a pressurized cabin, thousands of feet in the air. You're really at the mercy of the pilot. You'd be pilots. safer on a ship. Technically, you'd be safer on a ship than flying. It seems that way. Because as soon as you get in a plane, once it's up in the air, you're dead if it, something happens. Whereas if you're on a boat... The water, I think, is much more intimidating, at least to me. I was going to say, that's to you, though. <laughs> the, yeah. Mm. But I think I could make an argument for the water being more intimidating in, in the fact that the plane crashes is done. It's over. Yeah. Especially if it's just the lost style. Yeah. Right? It's lost. That's but true. if you crash in the ocean and you have the life drafts working, ooh. I mean, on a plane, the yeah, plane crashes. Yeah, it in crashes, the ocean. but you can do a crash landing on the water. But you're like in the middle of like the Mediterranean Sea or something, mm. the Pacific Ocean. The sharks swimming around. You see a whale in the distance. You see no one in the horizon. Mm. No helicopter. No island. No country. You're just out there with you and a couple of people in your raft. You got your little. You know how they tell you they got your little uh, whistle. You, you got a little whistle. Mm. Yeah, you better blow that whistle <laughs> all day until somebody hears you. No, that that is that is that is also quite terrifying. But you make peace with it in the end. Your body would start eating itself. You'd lean out. Mm, yeah, you would. And then you'd get real lean. There's a um, anorexic lean. I don't know if it was a movie or if it was just something that I seen. But there was a guy and he was stuck out in the ocean for however long. Um, and you know, it's like when you have a bath and you come out and your skin's all wrinkly. Yeah. Yeah, but he was stuck in the ocean for so long that like all of his skin was just like really soft. And Ooh. yeah, he. W- but the only way that he could get out, um, he f- eventually saw land and he was like, I'm heading straight was there. Was he swimming the whole time? Yeah, yeah. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what he was doing out there in the first place, but something happened and he was just a human body as opposed to whatever vessel that he had. And so he was out there and he was stuck for days and days and days. And um, he was there for so long that his body was like super wrinkly super soft and then he, when he finally saw land um he 
because his skin was so soft and when he was coming up to land there was like barnacles everywhere but normally no. normally they suck anyway but like no. because of his like the state of his skin it just no. him getting out was no. just like <laughs> don't tell me i know it was just cutting his whole body and it, and he looked like a bear had attacked oh, him oh cut i ridiculous. thought i thought you meant like peel his fucking oh, no. whole skin away no. right, but cool, he, but he looked shocking and he yeah. was like the pain of Ugh. getting onto land even though he was really glad to see land he was like that was unbearable like it was that's a hardened man after that that man you are not <laughs> fucking with that man mm. he would be like fuck the coronavirus i've been in an ocean for a week mm. jesus it just sit, he said that um yeah he'd like at night time because when you're really far out in the ocean there's a lot of bioluminescence getting around at night that's oh, beautiful so when and when you're swimming and you're the only thing moving around they move around you so he's like he'd be like the only thing that was like somewhat beautiful out of all of this was at night time when i would like be floating on my back and i'd be doing the slightest amount of movement to save energy but there'd be bioluminescent um bacteria or whatever moving around oh my body God. and he said it was really interesting i would never do it again of course for that but he was like yeah that was um one thing that he was like i oddly looked forward to night time because of that well, but multiple nights he was out there yeah he was like but the daytime was actually oh my God. yeah it was like a long time can you imagine how strong of a swimmer and calm you have to be mm. like i think that's the biggest thing like i've nearly drowned three times okay and each time has taught me the importance of staying calm when you're f- panicking yeah when you feel like you're helpless and i think that's a skill that is that is learned also by actually being more skilled at the thing that makes you intimidated like if you are a confident swimmer and you know you've treaded water for like half an hour and an hour, like, okay, in your head, like I can do this. Like it can be done. Mm. Like I can figure a way to do this. But if you can't and you have no s- real skill, you just could panic. Yeah. This guy must have, who, what is he, a fucking Olympic swimmer? I don't remember what he was. Damn. Yeah. He can teach me how to swim. I don't remember what he was. Call me. <laughs> guy. I'll just get his number for you. Yeah, we don't know his name, but we'll get his no, number. I don't know his name, don't know his story, don't know where I heard it off, but... He's <laughs> as gonna, far as... He's going to ring Alex. <laughs> as far as we know, you made this up. <laughs> no, it was it was legit. I just remember seeing, like, or just picturing the wounds that he would have had from getting up. Because that's so harsh, like... Oh, I hate barnacles. And, like, growing up, for the most part, like, near the ocean, like, I could just imagine how wrinkly his skin will be and how much that would have hurt. Um, he made it, though. Yeah, he did. That's a sweet life after that. It's gratitude. Yeah. I think a lot of people... The more I watch shows about the ocean, I'm just like, we shouldn't be in here. Oh, What are we no. doing? Like, get out. We're not... Why do we think we're okay to be in here? We're not. Like scuba diving? Just everything. And even there was a, a video... Like, everything. Everything that we just do in the, the ocean... Beach. We should not be in the ocean. Like, we should be knee-deep, if that, in, in the ocean, that's it. I'm like, but I love the ocean. I will Same. happily swim in it any day. Like, it's therapy. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's... Yeah calming yeah it's grounding and um but like we should not be there what are we doing and we have a lot we have a lack of not respect but like there are a lot of people who especially people who grow up in the city and then they go on holidays out to their little um like the gold coasts of wherever they live and they think that they can just go out and go swimming and nothing's going to happen to them because they don't understand what it's like to be out in the ocean they don't understand rips. They don't understand tides. They don't understand sandbanks. But they who's don't, teaching They you? don't even understand the colours of the, the ocean. Like, if it's darker out there... It's deeper. Yeah, it, well, sometimes. Like, sometimes it's deeper. But um, it also means that um, there's rocks underneath there. Like, so... It's casting shadows? Or it's just darker because the colours are darker? It's because, like, the rocks are darker colour. Yeah, that's what I mean. Say if it's, like, a really, a really beautiful day and, like, it's aqua green and then there's rocks like you can tell like it's darker there because there's rocks there mm. it doesn't necessarily mean it's deeper but sometimes it does mean that it's deeper that's but you don't know <laughs> that's a good point. yeah so and then sometimes it'll be a deeper spot and you think that okay there's rocks there but maybe it's not rocks maybe it's just like a whole bunch of seaweed and but y- you don't know you don't know and i think recognizing when you're in a rip um well you only fucking really realize until you're in it i've had people like um when i was in singapore actually where did we go we went to bali as a group and I was... You go to Bali? Yeah, we went to Bali. you were in Singapore? Yeah, as a group. Like, the whole group of us. We, we oh. did a whole group trip. The whole 15, 16 of us. It was, it was amazing. Um, the place we went... Oh, God, it's far, so far away from, like, the main... You know, there's, like... Have you been? No, I've never been to Bali. Okay, so it's like the main area. The, like, the, the uh, 
the Seminyak area, mm. like the Kuda area, the, f- the more touristy That's area. The west, yeah, Western yeah. style area, or like where a lot of people go to party. Is yeah, that right? exactly. Yeah. Right. We, w- we we decided to get away from that. Um, two hours away, we 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 soon realized which on a van taxi or with all of us, it's a it's a long trip. You see beautiful country, but it's a long trip, and so we're out in these surf beaches. And these surf beaches, people go to to properly surf, right? They're tough. Like we spoke, I spoke to one surfer. He's like, these are hard beaches to surf at. A lot of rocks, black sand. And uh, I was trying to get them to point out to me um, how to read the ocean because mm. it's a skill. And I, I was having trouble doing it. I thought I was getting it. But the, 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 the biggest part is recognizing the changes, I think, in the ocean uh, and when you're getting pulled across, and not realizing how you're getting pulled across by a rip or just the, the, the tide changing and you're getting pulled across into a rip and there can be a, a patch here you can stand at right in the middle and then just it kind of dips down mm. right it dips down and that's where it's pulling you right i'm doing a kind of a very rough example of a rip and i got pulled into one there yep okay after they told you oh this i think it was like a early in the day okay or yeah. a different day right um no they didn't tell me where the rip rolls at the beach mm. i don't think so uh they just told me anyway kind of what a rip looked like yeah, yeah 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 an example further down or something and uh i get my f- my my friends are at, well, pretty much all of them are ahead of me all of them are ahead of me and they're, they're having fun jumping on the waves blah 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 and, and i'm behind uh because i was trying to be more cautious yeah my cautiousness and lack of awareness pulled me into a rip and did they also get put into that rip uh, no mm. but until i called over for them for for help then they came and help and they they fuck they're so good that three the three australians i came with yeah. as part of deacon um they're all good swimmers and one in particular is a swim teacher so he's especially uh proficient and they did such a good job at, at helping me um i was like I need to save their life one time. You know, I I owe them. Um, But just that moment when you realize, fuck, I can't touch the ground. That moment when you can't touch the ground and you also know in the same vein that you're not a confident swimmer to get yourself out of here. Um, You don't, you feel helpless because you don't realize how much time I have left before I, because what you, if you begin to panic as naturally you often do, your heart rate jacks up, your respiratory rate jacks up. Right? So you waste all this energy and you feel like maybe you can even pass out from just being too tired, right? When in fact, you can stay in that rip if you could just stay calm, right? But the waves were chopping too. The waves were, it wasn't perfectly calm, okay? The waves were coming and they hit you and then you have to go under the waves. Yeah, so I was using more energy. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you're having to go, they're telling me like, go under the wave and like you got to hold your breath and you and you try and stay calm and you come up again. You try and regulate your breathing really carefully as I was trying to do. And then you swim across. You mm. swim across diagonally or horizontally across. Mm. And um, they got my ass out of there. And they helped me get out of there. And it's just over. It was like 10, 20 meters yeah. over. And like, fuck. I was just mad because it's like that's a situation of weakness that you don't want to get yourself into. And you're just disappointed in yourself. But it's my fault. It's my fault. I don't have that skill set. Um. So, be careful. Yeah, the ocean is a, a scary place. Yeah, very scary. Place. She don't give a fuck about you. No. Nah. She's gonna take and give in and out. It's just hard to resist the ocean, though. <laughs> it's hard to resist it. She's like a siren calling. Yeah, that's no, beautiful. It, yeah. The beach is beautiful. Yeah, you go to a calm, nice beach. Yeah. Look at the sunset, sunrise. There's, um, <laughs> this is how bored I've been during COVID, but I've been watching a lot of Bondi Rescue because I love that show. Um, and I see it all the time. Like, I, I understand when people don't go out, or th- sorry, they go out um, at the wrong time because they assume that because it's flat, it's fine. It's not, it's a rip there, but they can't see it because they've come over from wherever they've come over and they don't, they've not grown up with the ocean. But then there are other times when people just go out in the ocean and it's noticeably like, choppy like you shouldn't be there not many people are in there but they go out anyway is that kind of person that really frustrates me like 
when I go home and I, there's like one beach in particular at home it's known it's just like the surfing beach you don't really swim there a lot because it's choppy like you sh- shouldn't really be swimming there there's lots of rips and it's you need a board basically and when you do like a beach drive and you might be like looking at you be like man that's really choppy today but then there'll be people do like walking out there to go for a swim and you know that they're not from here and you're like this beach isn't patrolled like you shouldn't be here that's when it really frustrates me when people think that they can just go but then they're also unaware maybe they're but maybe they are aware maybe they just do it because they want to test themselves i don't know i just don't really maybe it's a mix but i think a lot of time people just they want to go in the ocean they've come all this way yeah they want to go in yeah no they don't know the risk or they'll take the risk did you see there's a video getting around Facebook of these two orcas? I was swimming around these two kids. Orcas are my favorite animal in the whole world. They're dangerous, aren't they? They are super dangerous. They're super smart. And like a lot of animals, they're not going to eat something unless they're hungry. And these kids were just really damn lucky that it wasn't their day. Like An orca is a type of whale, right? It's a killer whale. Yeah. Yeah. The, the black and white ones. Um, so smart. But yeah, it was basically this video of these kids. Was, was it like a blue ocean? Uh, New like Zealand? A, yeah, probably, yeah. And I think their parents like yelling at them from the balcony of their holiday home. <laughs> so ridiculous. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I see these two fins. I think the dad's just like, stay calm or something. Can you hear that? Yeah, I think so. It's kind of in a cove? Yeah. Yeah, so what we're watching is these two fins coming out the water real ominously. Holy shit, they're going towards the kids. Yeah. Oh, shit. They're going to get jacked. But how's it, Dad? Stay still. Are they standing or swimming? I don't know. I'm pretty sure they're just swimming. Oh, my God. That is amazing. These these orcas just swam right past these kids. Yeah. They kind of just went right around them. Where do, they look like it came from the shore. They're really close in. Yeah, they are. It's like they came into this cove. Yeah, just... <laughs> you hear these kids screaming. Yeah, screaming. This is in New Zealand. That kid would not do well in a rip. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it's, it's, it's like the parents knew what to do. Like, stay still, we've been here before. But, like, when? Where, well, like, where did they think that would be okay to say, just stay still? I'm sure, like, where did they get that from? I mean, I, I think it's just intuition in the moment, I'd Stay assume. Still. Like, because you don't want to startle an animal, right? You don't want to make sudden movements yeah. or go towards it. They're so smart, though. They don't give a shit if you're still or not. They know they're bigger than you. They'll just eat you anyway. It doesn't matter. Well, I think for an orca, I think for a lot of animals, yes, that's right. Like, don't like stay still if you're with an animal who like for, like a a kangaroo or something like that. Like, obviously, don't advance towards a kangaroo because they're gonna kick the shit out of you. But like, an orca, I don't think it matters because they're smart as fuck. Well, th- this is a YouTube comment to so take it for a grain of salt. Yeah. But <laughs> there's not one single record of an attack of wild orcas on humans. So, I don't know how true that is. But even if that's a little bit true. Mm then that's good. That is good. Because your panicking and risking of drowning could be your demise more than an orca taking you out. That's an interesting video. But don't fuck with orcas. I love orcas. They're, they're insane. Have you seen the documentaries by David Attenborough I've on that stuff? I've seen so many documentaries about orcas. Uh, pro- yeah, definitely. Why do, why do they interest you so much? Because... Because they're smart? Yeah. I love the way they hunt. What does that mean? Um, they hunt in packs and they help each other out. And there was a video that I watched ages ago. This was like when I was a kid. And it probably should have freaked me out, but it didn't. But it was um, this seal that was like stuck on this big bit of ice. And um, these two orcas were like helping each other out on either side of the ice to like tip it. So then they would, the seal wow. would eventually go into the ocean so they could get it. And I was like, that's really smart. <laughs> and also I was just, it was just like teamwork and it was great. And they also, um, I don't know if you've probably seen this if you've watched a documentary, but they, if they kill something, like a whale, um, which they do. They which kill are, whales? Yeah, they do. They kill whales. And they will take, they eat the fatty parts first because that's a, the part that has the most nutrients. And then they'll take it down to the bottom of the ocean and they'll bury it there. It's 83, you say the heaviest you've ever been. How, how, how height? How height are you? How tall are you? <laughs> is what I was supposed to uh, say. 178. 
centimeters ish, okay, five yeah. eleven ish. Yeah. Um, so using this time as an opportunity to continue to work on my goals, uh, performance and body composition uh, goals, and reach you know the best physical shape of my life that I possibly can. Um, you know, but now learning more about nutrition, especially with these nutrition units, reshaping the the way I approach nutrition a little bit, like macronutrient profiling, like how, how I distribute my macronutrients. And um, now taking a step back, trying to lean out a little bit and then re, re-changing, re-adjusting how I approach uh, that body composition change um, once I try and get back up like again. Like re-adjusting how you change how to lean out. Uh, yes. Because of your understanding of nu- of nutrition from the units that you've done. Yes. As opposed to when you were doing it before. When yeah. When you we didn't do the units. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that's just taking into consideration the percentage of fat versus carbs. Uh, and that I wouldn't pay as much attention to how much fat I was intaking versus carbs. Um, like high fat and high carb is not usually a good combination. Um, mm. Can be very inflammatory. It can, it can, it can equal, especially if you're in a, if specifically if you're in a caloric surplus, more energy in, more energy out. Then a lot of fat is going to get deposited um, in the presence of high carb if it's high fat as well. Yeah. Because you're already in a surplus. Yeah. And we don't have a fat reserve. It just gets stored. Um, and so, and learning about, all right, what happens when you just consume more glucose? Well, how much of that? How much of extra glucose you consume uh, gets converted to fat? And it's actually not that much. What happens though is you consume more glucose, it ramps up glucose oxidation. So the more glucose you consume, the more glucose gets oxidized, mm. which is really interesting because the process of which glucose is converted to fat is something called de novo lipogenesis, lipo, fat, genesis, creation. Um, and de novo is referencing carbohydrate conversion to fat. And they did this study of uh, a massive... Uh, an overfeeding group did 150 to 200% um, extra intake uh, over their baseline. Mm. And what they noticed is the group that stayed at baseline, okay, they were just at maintenance, isocaloric maintenance versus one that did 150 to 200% extra in a surplus. The group that just had isocaloric, energy in, energy out, they're the same. They had 4% uh conversion de novo lipogenesis from car- glucose to fat whereas the group that had the overfeeding with all carbs they had 12 percent. so it really or is or was it 14 percent? it was only about a 10 percent increase yeah. of extra fat deposition from increasing glucose and increasing calories 150 to 200 percent more so there's not that many there's not that much more fat that gets converted from extra glucose but if you have a high carb and a high fat, then because you're, uh, because fat doesn't have a like a storage mechanism like a liver or muscle, it's just gonna get stored um, as triglycerides like immediately. Yeah. And so learning that, and kind of the biochemistry of carb, fat, and protein metabolism is really really interesting. You did it, nutritional physiology. Yeah, I love that unit. That's a good unit. There you go. Yeah. So you can tell me if I'm. Well, I don't like. I had done that unit a long time ago. Yeah. I remember the time doing it, and being like, "This is a good unit." Um. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. I think I vaguely remember reading that study as well. Um, there you go. There's so many studies that make you read; it's ridiculous. But, um, yeah, I remember taking that back and being like, "Okay, well, um, instead of being like high fat, high carb, and like minimal protein, just pick one of fat or carbs, and then do protein." Yeah. Um. Well, p- protein. What's really important about protein is that we need those amino acids. Um, people just think protein, amino acids, like muscle, like skeletal muscle. Yeah, it's frustrating. What you realize is that every single cellular function cell in the body requires protein. Yeah, like an enzyme is protein. There you go. And like every, our, like yeah, it's it's nuts. Every enzyme in our body, um, that every enzymatic process that happens in our body, we need protein to facilitate and but people just like i need to eat protein for muscle like you need to eat protein to live like you it's no like, yes 
and yeah, people don't, but people don't understand that um, because that's just the way that protein is being marketed as something that yeah, help you get big mu- exactly. Big muscles. But it's important for like and it's harder to teach someone like what an enzyme is um, without them actually having like a, a invested or not invested, but like them wanting to learn more about nutrition because they're actually interested in that field. Whereas lots of people are interested in exercise because they see the effect of it physically on their body. So they're just like, oh, okay, well, I understand protein because I have muscles and yeah. But like if you tell someone who's not actually that interested in nutrition, um, like, oh, you should eat protein for the enzymatic processes that it helps your body facil- facilitate, they're going to be like, I don't give a shit about that because I can't see it. Right. But I can see muscles grow on my arms if I eat lots of protein. But you can you can, you can can market it and you can... S- you can open the conversation up through that and then give them the bonus of like, hey, guess what? Protein isn't just helping your yeah. muscles, it's helping your brain. Yeah. It's helping every cell. You're fun- if you want to function better as a human being and feel a little bit better, then having some good quality protein sources and getting all your amino acids because you realize that all the amino acids, you know, essential, non-essential amino acids? Yeah. Well, they teach that, oh, all, all amino acids are actually essential. Um, you, you need them all. Mm. It's just essential as it describes whether they're made endogenously in the body, yeah, which essential is not. You need it to get from food sources. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Very interesting. And so learning about that has been uh, super practical and valuable. So what did you change? Did you go more carb? Yeah. Yeah. I did. Um, to, do, to, to get somewhere you've never been, you've got to do something you've never done. Mm. And so I did high carb and I've gone a lower fat. And even though like fat is important, no, like people demonize fat, it's historically been done by uh, I think Ansel Keys in that uh, study he did with all these countries. And he, do you remember that? He, he excluded these countries in this big study that um, said that uh, fat implied cardiovascular disease. Was it called like the seven country study or yeah. something like that? Yeah. Yeah, but I the, remember saying The problem that. is he omitted a lot of the other countries that uh, didn't support uh, that linear relationship yeah as in like from the beginning or they were included and then he um exempted them from the results he exempted them from the graphs and the results okay um yeah. so can you still do that can you can't st- do that <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that can you well he did it ah, that was a long time ago but yeah i don't think anyway yeah that's that's <laughs> that's why you got found out that's why you got exposed yeah right eventually i mean you could probably get away with more shit in the 70s when there's no internet in the 80s mm. so i've gone the high carb lower fat route even though fat is important for like uh you know cholesterol is important for uh, including that for uh hormones sex hormones testosterone estrogen cortisol um, vitamin d so fat is needed uh but i'm trying this approach based on carb and fat metabolism yeah but at the same time you can do uh a lower carb high fat moderate high protein that can that can work for you too but you have to be careful about things like uh, how you metabolize fats. Like you can have an, have an FTO gene means that I don't metabolize saturated fat as effectively as that predisposes me to type 2 diabetes and obesity. Mm. So I don't... I oh, don't is that st- another reason why you also chose to increase your carb intake? Because yeah. you're like, I also have this genetic... Well, that particularly, if you have that genotype, then that particularly uh, made me um, want to go lower saturated fat as well. Even if I was doing high fat, I'd, I would pick a lower saturated fat mm. so minimizing coconut oils and and do people, leaner meats yeah. people cook with coconut oil and think it's this miraculous thing it's not <laughs> what it's are really your, not what are your thoughts on it it has uh, good properties um yeah what's go ahead tell me your thoughts i'm just trying to think of uh i think uh it's I think it was like last year or maybe the year before, whenever it was like super big. I know it's still technically a little bit big now, but like, you know, when a lot of foods have had their time, kale had its time in the light, apple cider vinegar had its time in the light and like lemon water had its time in the light and then coconut oil had its time in the light. And um, it's it's almost like 100% saturated fat. Mm-hmm. And if you um, use it all the time in all your cooking and you're eating like... I, don't, I wouldn't even I don't even know what the amount will be like just say you're eating a third a cup a day like you're going to see that effect over time if you're consistent with it um, I I believe that y- you will see a, a, a dramatic increase in like fat from from that just that consumption of that one thing whereas like but then there are a lot of beauty um, 
and like pharmacists and whatever that are saying like hey like you should use this for your skin and um your hair and whatever and i think it's great for that purpose i don't think it's meant to be um re- as a replacement for like butter in cooking i don't think it's meant to be a replacement for that but people think it is. So i don't think it's meant to replace all the oils that you use in cooking because just because of its f- saturated fat content i think that people need to choose other oils rather than use coconut oil because of this high saturated fat yeah. intake yeah yeah but um while that has that can have some deleterious negative effects uh, from an inflammation perspective, from a genetic perspective, and predisposing you towards certain health ailments, are there are there any other characteristics of coconut oil and saturated fat that that you think that you don't like that are a reason you avoid and minimize coconut oil? Um, that I don't like. I just like why would I eat something that I know would like increase my LDL and HDL cholesterol yeah. unnecessarily. Like there are other oils. Like, yeah, if I'm cooking something high heat, I'm not going to use olive oil. But I, people don't know what kind of oils to choose. So they'll go with like canola oil, choose rice bran oil. Basically only two oils you need, rice bran oil and olive oil. Rice bran oil when you're cooking high heat, olive oil when you're cooking regular stuff. Like that's all you need. You don't need coconut oil. People use coconut oil because it's good with high heat. That's why people use it. It's got a high smoke point. Yeah doesn't go rancid yeah um but just replace that with rice bran oil not canola oil not vegetable oil rice bran oil I've never used rice bran oil there's some really good um graphs out there uh that describe different oils um that are not processed and what are good with heat and i think uh, avocado oil i'm a big fan of that i use it's more expensive, expensive yep, yeah uh, but i'm a fan of that uh, walnut oil i've used before um and that but that you got to be careful with higher heat but it can be pretty good, you know, if you're roasting something in the oven, you mm. want to, gu- you know, put something on it. Uh, it's probably expensive too, but... Yeah, but you know what? Um, I, every, This is a luxury that a lot of people can't afford, and I, I, I don't think it should be a luxury, but it's called a luxury. Like, But I think we need to change how the mentality which we approach food, the fuel that which we nourish our brains and bodies with. Um, I don't think it should be a, a luxury that you can have whole nutritious foods and oils and all these things, like... I think that if we need to reframe our priorities. That should be the priority, you know, the the life that gives us life. Like, I don't think you should be looking at if you can. Mm. But I know it's tough for some people; they can't. But if you can do it, and if you're making more than oh, call it thirty, forty, fifty thousand plus a year, like let's let's start reshaping the way we invest our money and invest that money a little more wisely into the food that sustains our life. Yeah, but then it's so hard to motivate people because they want to spend their money on other things. Bring that close. You it's can bring closer. it on the, on the table. Yeah, it's a re- it's a <laughs> that, that was a <laughs> right in front that, of me. That was a begrudging. <laughs> <laughs> put it in. Um, yeah, I mean, I try and get everyone around me to do that, but I don't force it on them. Yeah, you like can't. Maybe force I would have probably try to do it before but like um yeah i I have the same view like why would you um spend your money on things that like like health is the most important thing that we have whether that be emotional or physical like nutritional health like everything it's so important so but we spend our money on a lot of other things because they're shiny and we want to forget our problems Yeah. yeah yeah exactly there's so many reasons why people buy mm. um, to comfort themselves. And I actually, I'm going to take a detour. And I want to actually, you asked me where I think the coronavirus came from. And I want to, there's a, there was a study in Nature, which is a very like renowned, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, a publication that mm-hmm. people put their research articles in. And they said that if genetic, in this study, the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2 could have been man-made. If genetic manipulation had been performed, one of the se- several reverse genetic systems available for beta coronavirus would probably have been used. However, the genetic data irrefutably show that SARS-CoV-2 is not derived from any previous used virus backbone. Instead, we propose two scenarios that can plausibly explain SARS-CoV-2. One, natural selection in an animal host before zoonotic transfer. Number two, 
natural selection in humans following zoonotic transfer. Wait, repeat those two again. They sounded almost exactly the same. <laughs> Did I just say the same thing twice? <laughs> natural selection animal host bef- a- before zoonotic transfer. Natural selection in humans following zoonotic transfer. So I'm not sure the exact difference. Uh, one, I think they're describing the direction of where it came from. So going from animals to humans or humans to animals yes. and then back to humans again. But potentially, something like that. And so they did this, uh, they analyzed the, um, fuck, they used some complicated genetic science that I don't understand. Mm. SARS-CoV-2 features including optimized RBD and polybasic cleavage site in, re- in related to cor- coronavirus in nature. We do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. Now that is one study in a very reputable uh, journal uh, and then there's evidence that it was made in a lab in Wuhan. What evidence is that? The evidence I that... I not any evidence of that. I just heard it. Well, it's. I think it's more circumstantial evidence, if that makes sense, meaning it was... Um, there's this bioweapons lab in Wuhan uh, that they believe they could have made the coronavirus at and it could have accidentally or on purpose leaked out and mm. got spread to other people. And then there's some evidence that it may have originated in a, in a US, uh, a US um, base, uh, military base uh, that make um, viruses like this. So why is the military base making viruses? <laughs> now, the, what? New, the new coronavirus could <laughs> have originated in the US since that country is the only known to have all five types. Five, there's different, so different types of... Um, they describe the coronavirus, which all others must have descended. Wuhan in China has only one, le- one of these types, rendering it in, in an analogy as kind of a branch, which cannot exist by itself, but must have grown from a tree. Uh, no epidemiological link found between the first patient and the later cases. They state their data also shows that in total, 13 of the 41 cases had no link in the marketplace in Wuhan. Um, mm. it's Fort, I don't know. So America has all five. Fort Der- yeah, of these, c- c- apparently. Okay. Mm. Uh, Fort Derrick. It was a biowelfare lab um, this, that got shut down previously. So they have had, they've had a thousand plus events where pathogens have been stolen or escaped from American bio labs during uh, the prior ten years. So that that's another suspicion. So uh, you know, I, I believe it's the the likely probable um, cause at this point seems to be uh, zoonotic mm. um, from an animal to a human or human to animal, then back. What do you think? I agree with that. Out of all the things that I've heard, all the reasons or all the, not excuses, but just (laughs) ideas about where coronavirus came from, um, because that's where other other viruses have came from, um, like that are like part of the COVID branch. Um, So that's from, uh, from all of what I can see, that's what I also assume as well. Right. But I have no idea. I have no idea. And I don't really... Like, if it, if it was, like, a, something that um, the Chinese created or the... I don't think I'd really care that much either. Would it change what we're doing right now? I think it would change how you respond to it. I think it would change globally how, like, sanctions on the country. It would change political relations. It would change the way the public views China. Yeah, but I don't think... Decrease trust. I don't think that... There's consequences. Like, just say that that is what happened. Oh, there's so many hypotheticals. I hate talking about hypotheticals. I hate it, honestly. But I'm gonna. Because <laughs> why not? I'm gonna. Um, so, yeah, just say that, yeah, somehow we found out that, yeah, it was created in a lab in China. We don't know exactly what their intent was, but whatever, they created it and it spread out. Um, I think our world is so messed up that we would, for a short term, be like absolutely hating on china like absolutely hating on them and then but we're going to soon realize that we need china because they make all the shit that we use to make other shit and that's the problem that's the weakness (laughs) and then we're just going to go back and they're just going to own us and like until we learn to manufacture and create drugs pharmaceuticals and products here realizing it's going to cost a little bit more um but that or maybe a lot more but that, that's a necessary uh, consequence that we have to go through in order to put more control in our hands and less control in others. 
Yeah, but it's just going to take too long. And then we're going to have to lower our wage, which people are not going to be happy with. Why? Because the government is going to be like, well, we need to create all these things, but our wage is so high. We're not going to be able to pay everyone, but we also need to be able to make everything. So what do we do? We're going to have to lower the wage. Sorry. You guys have to do more work and get less money. But, and then everything will go down from there because if people are earning less money, they're not going to have money, enough money to rent. We're not going to have enough money to buy houses. We're not going to have money to buy enough food, as much food, not enough food. So then the price of food is going to have to somehow go down. But it was just, we would turn into China. The, the economy would, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be a good thing. So we need countries like that. We need countries. That's why I, I used to study in economics. So I used to think like, why don't we just make everything ourselves? I don't get it. It's so stupid. Why don't we just make everything in our country? But like, we need countries who can make things cheaper than us because it's more sustainable for them to be able to do like that. We need countries to have compati- comparative advantage. What I think, yeah, that's it. But is that worth in the long term is that worth it in the long term the consequences of relying on other countries to provide for you considering that uh there are many times and there will be more times where they won't be able to provide for you like india and and china um they could limit and they are limiting india is limiting the amount of pharmaceuticals that they're exporting out now Mm. is that worth the risk I think, that's when it, I think that's when it becomes individual. Then it's up to the in- individual to be prepared. Yes, it is. Because I don't think we can survive in a world where our countries don't cooperate with each other. But at an individual level, we also need to be aware and be prepared for things that that will happen. We're not. Got to prepare. Prepare for the yeah. worst plan. Hope for the best. Because you can't, yeah, we can't say, oh, every country needs to do their own thing. They need to produce everything themselves because there are factors out of our control that affect the production of those things, like food, for example. Like, there are a lot of countries that, we, like, they don't have our climate, we don't have their climate. That's fair. Like, but like the middle of Australia, we can't fucking grow shit there because it's hot as hell. <laughs> Everyone's living underground, so, like... But th- there are goods and there are a lot of things that we can manufacture on our own and maybe there's more of a shift we need to have some fail safes we need to have the ability and maybe that there is more of a shift that we need to make into manufacturing more of our own um so we are prepared and not caught with that pants down when these things do happen you know australian made american made swiss made norwegian made i just think of chocolate when you talk about swiss <laughs> there you go they own that chocolate they're keeping that in their side their borders right now that's fine <laughs> I don't need to get fat. Like, yeah. <laughs> as long as you're in a deficit. Yeah, as long as I'm or in a deficit or maintenance. I mean, I mean maintenance right now. It's good. It's a good time. Casey Drew, we've been talking for about three hours now. Has it been three hours? How are you feeling? Yeah, good. You good? Yeah. What about you? Do you want to stop? I think we should conclude. Okay. Right about now. <laughs> All right. I think that's a good place to end. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For coming on. No worries. And talk to some chimps. We should talk again sometime. Anytime. Okay. Let's do it. Yep. Done. See you, chimps. Bye. Stay safe. <laughs>